Shut up and sit down. Mr. John Roca. Yo. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm we're recording this right after I did the live QA on the movie trivia Schmodown page. So I'm all hyped up. Are you hyped up or are you worn out? No, I'm yeah. not. I, I love to talk, man. So yeah, yeah. you know, I, I I listened to the Emma one to kind of prep for how this would go. But you actually listened to my episode of Emma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love Emma to death. Yeah, yeah. And I've never met anyone who can talk as much as I can until uh, I met Emma Fife. Oh, and, yeah. And she can talk. And <laughs> she's at this high level all the time. Yeah. And so it's like, I'm like. Well, I'm, I go in spurts and doses, but if I get passionate about something, I can always reach that level, no matter how tired or exhausted or worn out I am. But I am, I'm in no way that right now. Really? Are yeah. you more introverted or extroverted? Oh, come on. What? What? <laughs> I'm an but, extrovert. But but there's a difference because like, oh. when, like when you have spurts of energy, like you can have that, like you can be on, but yeah. then when you're introverted, you get home and you just like crash. Oh yeah. When I crash and I come home, uh-huh. I'm chill. Yeah, yeah. Like I won't say a word and uh-huh. I'll just be sitting here watching television for like an hour or three hours or whatever. And I just won't say a word. So I value my privacy. I value my alone time a lot. Okay. Uh, Cause when I'm out doors or when I'm, I just, I am a natural like talker of pe- two people mm-hmm. and I like to do that, which is kind of why I get, I think I got into this whole like hosting thing and podcasting thing is that I just I like talking to people. And so for me, when I'm outside the house, I feel this need that I have to, right? But when I'm here, I don't. And so it's interesting because I live here. I don't know any of my neighbors. You and don't I've, talk I've, to any of them? No. Uh-huh. And I've lived here for six years. Really? And it's not because I don't want to know them. Uh-huh. If I organically met them in passing and had a conversation with them, great. But do you avoid them? I don't avoid them. I don't uh-huh. cross the street or anything like that. I'll say hi if I walk past them. Yeah, yeah. But I don't stop and have a conversation with them. Wait, immediate neighbors or like or like the people in this, the same building? The immediate Im- immediate neighbors, people's in the same building. You've whatever. never met them. Never. Like I've seen, I've said hi to them, mm-hmm. but I couldn't tell you their names to save my life of anybody who lives around me because mm-hmm. I don't want them up in my business. Oh. So I don't want to be up in their business. Like I was like, you, you do you. you. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. be over here doing me. That's not important to you to like know somebody in the area or no, 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 no doesn't because, matter to you. No, because I have so many friends, man. I have like 65 friends yeah. here in LA, like just within, and I have friends like within two blocks of walking distance. So like uh, I'm, I'm covered uh-huh. in that way. And I'm uh, always in contact with them over text or on chains or whatever. So, you know, I have enough interaction. That's a very specific number. Like, you know, you have 65. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yeah. We have a, we have a Facebook group. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's why. Cause we, it got to be too much to attach 65 emails to invite people uh, to birthday parties or yeah, yeah. children's things or whatever. And so we ended up creating a Facebook page and it's just all of us going like there. Yeah. I listened to your, uh, your outlaw nation podcast. Oh, thanks man. The, the, it's awesome. Thank you. It, it got so much, so many ratings, like off the bat, it just like yeah. went up to like 5,000 views, like overnight. I know, I know. it was really blown away by that mm-hmm. and very humbled by it too. But I, I heard on that, that you had like a group of like 57 people to, to go see star Wars. Yeah. See force awakens. Like, how can you get 57 people <laughs> like in a caravan or like whatever to the theater? Well, we didn't, uh, everybody met there, but uh, like, but like two of our friends are like executives. And so they, mm-hmm. and at studios, so they on their cards buy the tickets for all of us uh, and then we pay them back okay. through, you know, PayPal or Venmo or just personally give them cash or whatever. That's how it works. So I'm a bit pampered in that way. Uh-huh. And, 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 you know, and so when those big movies things had, those guys like to organize, those guys are built to organize things. So yeah. they'll send out the mass email and you say yes or no, and then they buy the tickets and you got to bring the money and, and whatever. Are they all friends from living in LA or from all over? Well, well f- there's a core of us that came here from Florida state mm-hmm. and moved together. Yeah. And then we're all still friends. And then we kind of, uh, melded or merged with another super group that had already been out here from like Cal and USC and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so they already were a group. And we just by happenstance, my friend Michael Vogel, who's one of the executive producers on the new My Little Pony movie, mm-hmm. he was in a play with our actress friend Vicki Kelleher, who does a bunch of commercials and teaches over at Leslie Kahn Studio. Uh, and then they had their own group of friends. So we kind of picked, and then we've picked people up like they've been assistants to Michael and my other friend Michael Ross at Sony. There have been people's boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives. Uh, so we have a, a, a shit ton. Oh, we're allowed to cuss, right? Yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, there's a the shit ton of people that we've just kind of uh, 
collectively organized as we move forward. And some people have stayed in the group. Some people have been unable to handle it because we can be a bit like a community, like we're all up in each other's business. Oh, you're up in their business. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, See, yeah. that's why I'm I'm full of being up in people's business. <laughs> like I don't need to be able to, like I, I don't want them up in my business yeah. here where I live because I have enough friends who are already up in my business in my life. But do you mind, like you're on a bunch of talk shows. Do mm-hmm. you mind if people know about your personal life or, or no, are there things? I don't give a shit. You don't give a shit? No, if, no, like, no. I'm me, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. other than the outlaw yeah. character, you're you on everything you've been on. Yes. Like, you're, that's you. That's 100% you. Yeah, that's John Roca. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't put on a show for anybody. No. And, and and Emma's that way. Some people ask me that. Does Emma like that in real life? Yes. Emma yeah. is like that in real life. Like, Because I get those questions too. Like, are you like that way off camera? Yeah. I'm that way. When I'm passionate about something, I get into it. You yeah, know? yeah. When I'm, and my friends will tell you about that. You know, like uh, I'm an intense guy with about certain things. I don't think, int- but intensity is kind of a negative word. I think I'm passionate. passionate intense means yeah. like you could kill someone at any moment. Yeah. That's not how I I am. I'm passionate. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's the way I am. And so, yeah, when, when I'm off camera or whatever, like I'm, I'm me, you run into me in a, in a, in a place and I'll say, hi, do you shake your hand? Be all warm and cool. You start asking me questions about stuff then I'm going to, we're going to have a conversation and yeah. it'll be fine. You know? I mean, so, that's what makes everything so great. If someone's just like indifferent about everything, that's not good radio. That's not exactly. good podcast. Exactly. You need to have that opinion about something. And that's, right. what, that's what makes you great at movie fights and stuff like oh, thanks, that. Man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fun time, man. <laughs> yeah, I can't win, but I love it. <laughs> is is Mance hundred percent? Is that yes. him? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Mance is absolutely that guy off camera. Yeah. He has given me so many high fives that should have broken my hands <laughs> or hugs that should have squeezed the life out of me. He's yeah. just an incredibly warm, good guy. Like, And he's got a soft heart, which is why when people go after him in our matches, I get upset, man, because Scotty's a good, good guy. Yeah. And he loves to play. And he loves to go back and forth. He loves to, he's, a, oh, he's an East Coast guy. We're both born in Philly. Uh-huh. So we have that kind of like, it's inbred in us, you know, like kind of back and forth. So we have a good time. But unfortunately, Scotty has a tough time handling those comments on YouTube and on uh, on Twitter and whatever when people go after him because like it just hurts him. Oh, and, he really and, gets upset. Yeah, he really does. Oh, oh yeah, he really that. does. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so he, he, Left the, she retired from the Schmodown for a while because after I beat him, he was upset at the comments on the on YouTube that were like people were so happy that that he got beat. Oh, like, like get rid of him. Like yes. he's done. He's oh, too really? loud. Oh. He's annoying. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for beating that annoying fuck. Like it just, oh, wow. it was crazy the things people said. And I tried to defend him at every moment I could and tell people to stop doing that. But it just got overwhelming for him, right? And the yeah. same thing happened to me when I left the movie Trivia Schmodown page after the loss to Riley. Like people just were merciless to and you to me yeah. and that's the thing they weren't differentiating between me and the character they were going after me that's what i, I myself was wondering i asked him i was like is that yeah. john roca playing yeah that's playing him playing the outlaw right that's not him like being a dick <laughs> right. right too many people think that like something yeah. with the and i had a conversation with christian about it because i was like people are accusing me of like physically abusing emma yeah. or doing these kind of things and that's that's gonna that's not something i would ever do like my mother raised me better than that like yeah. i would never put my hands on a woman never have yeah, yeah. and never will and so it's just like that i would never do that so when people started saying that it really bothered me people started saying like i was a whiny little bitch or choking or whatever like it just got to me because i yeah. was like you guys don't none of you fuckers don't know what it's like to be up here under the lights in front of these people doing it and fighting it and you guys are sitting back at your medium level job medium wage minimum wage job you're gonna judge my ass you're being you're a fucking uh, a clerk at Best Buy, kiss my ass, man. I'm trying to do shit and having fun, and I'm yeah. and I'm fighting my ass off. You want to come after me on a personal level? Go, go screw yourself, man. But I think the the it's difficult because you are you're using your real name. Yes, so that's why, like uh, that's him. right, right. But I'm the outlaw when uh-huh. I'm doing the Schmodown. But when I'm on, like on the movie trivia Schmodown page, it's John Stephen Roca that's on there uh-huh. talking and commenting. It's not the outlaw, right? If I had a separate outlaw account that I would come on and. and do that with and yes come at me full yeah. guns blazing because i'm gonna come after you yeah yeah, yeah that's, which, that's the character exactly yeah, yeah. which i've done like uh-huh. a, a couple of times people have gone a little too far and i've gone into their facebook profile pages and found pictures of them embarrassing <laughs> pictures of them and posted and going really i'm gonna take shit from this guy who thinks this is the right thing to wear on a, on a, on a you know these like this fashion choice makes sense <laughs> well you've like, gone that deep oh somebody, yeah really oh i'm a shit talker man like yeah, yeah. i'm east coast son if you're gonna come at me you better come in with all your guns. Yeah. It's just that's how it works, you know? That Because I, I I heard your story about how you stood up for yourself, like mm. after like years of just being down oh, yeah. on yourself. Yeah. I and was getting yeah. beat up and everything. So that's that's you finally like standing up and like mm-hmm. talking back. Yeah. Anybody tries to bully me or disrespect me or push me around, like I will go after them. And it's just how I'm built. And yeah. it's something I'm working on. Like my faith in God and Jesus Christ. And I've been chanting recently, like a, my friend of mine's like kind of walking me into the Buddhist practice as well. It's a way of letting go of that. Yeah. Like letting go of this need to 
defend myself or need to be, because that's real deep ingrained since I was, since I was a teenager, a child really. And so when I see it, it has caused me problems sometimes in friendships, sometimes in relationships. So it's something I'm working on now. The, and, the defending yourself? Is, yeah. Is yeah. Into, well, I know like, me or, thinking someone is being disrespectful or disrespect or, or doing it on purpose uh -huh. or bullying me on purpose or trying to intimidate me on purpose. I've, I've at times like misread things uh, like that. And so you get defensive before, exactly for no reason. Exactly. For uh, no reason in their minds, yeah, but yeah. a reason in my mind. Yeah. But is that like an insecurity issue where you think? Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And that's because I was like, I was made to feel pretty shitty about myself for a majority of my uh, uh, years growing up. Yeah. You said until you were 15, that's when you stood up for yourself. Yeah. You 15? Yeah. But yeah. it didn't eliminate that feeling that, the, that people, the kids used to make fun of me for being stupid, for being fat, for having a bald haircut, for not knowing how to dress, for uh, looking like a, like a Greek or a nerd uh -huh. or being heavy. Like there were so many things I got beat up about or made fun of like for a long time. Yeah. So that's, those are formative years. Uh -huh. so that shit stays in your blood for a long time. But those are also those things, the way I learned to fight back against those things were also what got me to succeed in life in That's anything the thing. Could, yeah you can either like cower down and just like just hide in, in your own little world and yeah. just disappear from everything or you can stand up and fight back and mm -hmm. do something and that's what you chose yeah that's the path i chose but but it's a balance yeah and that's what i'm discovering now at 46 like well i, say, right. I, I, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted to say no, your no, age it's fine. i don't give a shit like yeah. it's yeah people know who listen to me on other shows like how old i am and, and it was just something i'm discovering now is and, and cause I'd, 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 i had a uh, you know i've talked about on, on film therapy i had a breakdown last year and the breakdown was brought on from 30 years of fighting this fight and oh, okay. it was like I had run out of energy or the ability to fight anymore uh -huh. because I just kept seeing it and it was bleeding into my relationships and it was causing me unsuccessful relationships in terms of romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Because no matter, no matter how long I was with someone, I would eventually think that they were trying to lie to me about their feelings or lie to me about the, how much they cared about me because I didn't believe that they could. And mm -hmm. so that corrupted my interactions with them. Yeah. And I lost a couple of really amazing women in my life because of that. And I had a breakdown last year about it. And that breakdown led me to really start looking at this. And I had, I was like, I was with two therapists. I did a bunch of, I read a bunch of books about exploring this stuff. And so now me kind of walking back into my faith a little more firmer, a little more firmly rather, and then exploring the Buddhist stuff. That's me like slowly making changes in my life to mm. be a little more relaxed. And who knows, maybe I've lost all my opportunities to ever get married, Beardo, but like, I, at least I found, I discovered this in enough time to at least live the rest of my life somewhat in a more peaceful place. You know? uh -huh. So, so is it, is it your faith? Like, has the faith always been with you or is it like going through therapy and like realizing, having that self-realization mm -hmm. and just realizing, Hey, that I don't have to be like this. Yeah. My faith has always been with me since I was a child, uh -huh. but it's always been in and out of my life in terms of its strength, oh, okay. you know? And like through the military, I was really deep in my faith in the military in my, mm -hmm. in my twenties. Like that was really, like my nickname was the reverend uh -huh. because I was, oh, I always had a Bible in my hand. I was always reading the Bible when yeah. I was walk around and stuff like that. So I always had it. And so, um, but then it would go in and out as I felt more confident in my life. I felt like I didn't need it. I need to, you know, those kinds of things. You're like, oh, I can swagger through the world, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But then you get down. So with me, it was a combo of, it was first the therapy and stuff and then walking back. And so it's been a progression for me. Uh -huh. The therapy was first, you know, my uh, friend of mine really st stepped up and reached out and offered me to pay. She offered to pay for two therapists for me to uh -huh. kind of figure this out. Cause she's like, I don't want you to leave the planet. And Wait, I, I do. Sorry, sorry. Two yeah. therapists? Yeah, two therapists. Like so, you, you had to see two different people. Yeah, two different people at the same, at why, the same why, time. Why would you see two as opposed because, to one? Because one was about um, conversational therapy, uh -huh. which is okay. When this is happening, what's happening for you? Like let's, what's going through your mind? What's going through your mind? Oh, okay. Let's explore why you make, why you connect uh -huh. these thoughts together to lead to this reaction, mm -hmm. or, to, or this thought, or this feeling. Uh -huh. And the other um, therapist was a trauma therapist, mm -hmm. which is which brought me all the way back to elementary school. Like she brought me all the way back to elementary school with this this EMDR therapy, which is these two uh, paddles that you have in your hands, uh -huh. and they pl and the earphones you have on earphones, and then she controls the speed at which this sound goes back and forth, left to right, on your earphones. And there's like boop 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 boop, and and the paddles vibrate, uh -huh. and they're supposed to match. And it's supposed to regress you back all the way back to like the trauma moment. That 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 brings up like your memories. Or? Yes. Well, she asks questions. Oh, okay, so that, she's talking to you. Yes, about, oh, okay. she's talking to you while she's doing it, and then she's increasing the pace, and then mm -hmm. she'll stop. Like she won't stop the beeping. She'll stop. She'll go. Oh no, she will stop the beeping, and she'll go. Okay. 
let's focus on that. Uh -huh. Talk to me more about that. And then she'll start, and then she'll start the beeping up again. And it went back and forth, back and forth. And, boom, boom, boom. and so it brings you all the way back. Uh -huh. And so, and it's supposed to be an eight week process. Yeah. So that's what happened. It, she took, she got me all the way back to elementary school. Uh -huh. like, it was amazing. Yeah. I, I didn't know I still had those memories inside me. I mean, it's always going to be like in your subconscious. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Right. And the prof that's why they're professionals. Uh -huh. they can get, so they, she got me there to that moment. It was Oh, fucking amazing, man. How, how long ago was that? It was uh, uh, February. Like we started in December. This, and this past this December. past okay, December yeah, of 2016, yeah. and we stopped in March. Oh, so both, both therapists. Okay, so mm -hmm. it took you like 40 some odd years to get to that point to realize, hey, there's something going on deep inside me that I'm right. Not, yeah. Well, because it's really difficult to separate the reasons for why you succeed mm -hmm. versus the reasons why they also may be why you fail at times, and oh. so. When the reasons that you succeed also cross over to the reasons you fail sometimes, you have to extricate, extricate those pieces away from the overall, uh, uh, your overall self. Uh -huh. Like, wh who are you really? Like, what part of you is learned and what part of you is uh, uh, organic? Uh -huh. And so that's, those are those kinds of things that I was discovering. And, and I moved fast through it, mm -hmm. you know, because I was like... I wanted to learn. Yeah, because you're a super com competitive guy <laughs> <laughs> and, and no fault of your own. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but that, so that... <laughs> I've never, ever thought of it that way. That's brilliant. <laughs> when that you just wanted to complete the eight-week yeah, eight course yeah. in like seven weeks just to say yeah, you did. just to say I did it. <laughs> but, but I feel like if you set your How mind... How long did Riley take to do this? I want to beat his record. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. But I feel like yeah. if you set your mind to something, then you accomplish it. Yeah. So, so now that you understand like yourself, mm -hmm. you, you understand that you can be better at yourself. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and, is there other steps to take? Like, Oh yeah, I meditate a lot, uh -huh. um, which is great, really powerful for me. And also, well, the chanting has been a new thing that I've really enjoyed too. And I'm, I'm going to get my Gohansen and I'm going to get my, uh, and start putting that, I'm going to put that here. We're, we're in my place recording right now, but like where I'm pointing to my wall here where the mm -hmm. guitar is, I'm going to put the Gohansen and hang it up there and I'll be chanting. Chanting, Wait, and what, people come over and chanting. What stuff. is that? It's Gonson. It's it's a what is it? It's a scroll. The scroll, uh -huh. I think, is the scroll is that what you put in there, uh, and that's what you you chant to. Uh -huh. And there's a box you buy to put the scroll in so you can hang it because it has to be above you. Like uh -huh. it has to be, so you, you're looking up to chant and then you chant like, you know, however, and you do the prayers, morning and evening prayers and do the chanting. And so I'm exploring it to see uh -huh. what's going to happen for that, you know. And, and that so, centers you. In the, yeah, so, okay. it really does. I've already been to a few chanting sessions and it really, really does center you. You would think that like working out or something would help like release that anger or that fight in you. Well, working does working out does help, but uh -huh. I've kind of... I used to like be hardcore in a CrossFit. I don't go as much as I used to anymore. And mm -hmm. I, so I'm searching for something that's uh, a little more like um, long lasting. Oh, okay. And yeah, a little yeah. more uh, foundational. Yeah. Working out is great, but if I don't, if I stop working out, then, or if uh, I get lazy, then, yeah. but, but it's me, still there. Right, exactly. Yeah, 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 but yeah. me sitting up, literally getting up, waking up, rolling over, jumping on the other side of the couch and starting to chant mm -hmm. and do the prayers. It takes almost no effort, yeah. right? So to me, it's a, it's something that's a little more, a little more uh, has a little stronger foundation than just working out. That's true. You know? yeah, if yeah, I get yeah. injured, what the fuck am I going to do then? Yeah, yeah. You know, so and it's more of the working on the mind, yes. as opposed to just the physical aspect. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so I want to go back to yeah. your uh, your your uh, elementary school days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I can I can't picture you like chubby fat kid. Oh like, God, like bowl haircut. Yeah, man. you were just. I could I could pull out some pictures if you want to look at them, Beardo. No <laughs> yeah, lie, yeah, yeah, I have them right there. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, but is is home? You said you were born in Virginia, but you were no, I was born in Philly. Oh, uh huh. And raised in Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did Why did your parents move? Um, well, my dad had an opportunity with a job, uh -huh. and my mom had more of a, a ability to transfer because she was a nurse at oh. the time. So then we moved to Virginia about a year in, and a, a bunch of my father's brothers my uncles uh -huh. were there already so they had like a soft place to land oh, okay and so yeah so they they figured they moved down there my dad wanted to be closer to his family and stuff so so you were surrounded by family in virginia i was yeah oh, okay. yeah B bolivian family my my from both sides my mom my dad and mm -hmm. and so they and then my mom helped her aunts come over and her uncle come over from bolivia as well like because she came here when she was 18 uh -huh. so she had established herself and got a green card did the whole process my dad too and so it was a whole thing and so i was constantly surrounded by latino family members yeah. how, how old were your parents when they had you my mom was 25 my mom my uh -huh. dad was 35 okay so like 
kind of average normal yeah, around sure, that time it wasn't sure. like too young no 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 or like too old not too old yeah yeah not like me too old 46 <laughs> having a child now yeah i mean it's it's fine <laughs> <laughs> no judgment no judgment <laughs> no okay yeah. because I'm, I'm just wondering when you were when you were being bullied in in, yeah. in uh, elementary school yeah did you like go to your family or did you have anyone else like yeah, to, to stick up course. for you no no one stuck up for me my dad never wanted to teach me to fight because my dad had experienced a lot of terrible times growing up in uh bolivian argentina where where he was constantly using his fists. You know, uh, uh, are you you're Latino, right? Yeah, so yeah. you understand, like the machismo. Yeah, the machismo, all that shit is like, and it's from the old country. So you know that's deep in there. And uh-huh. this is a standard way of life. Yeah. Back then, you know. And so my dad never wanted me to learn to fight because he didn't ever wanted me to suffer the way he suffered. But know? even even when he sees you like come home like beat up, he's yeah. not, he doesn't say like, hey, stick up for yourself, no. do something. Well, he doesn't no. say stick up for yourself. He'd be like, just be stronger than them. Yeah. Be stronger yeah. than them because you, you know, you can and, and uh, to be fair, I was a fat that didn't look like I was athletic at all. So uh-huh. I'm sure my dad thought, well, f- I can't train this guy to fight, you know, <laughs> so look at it. A lost cause. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not faulting him. You know, I just didn't, I probably, he probably thought I, I wouldn't learn. And to be honest with you, I probably didn't. I'd have the ability to learn until that moment happened, which I talked about on, on the outlaw nation podcast. So like to me, yeah, that, that it was constantly coming home, constantly crying, constantly getting beat up, constantly like, it just was a terrible experience, man, mm-hmm. for years, man, fucking years, dude. And really? So, yeah. I can't imagine do- that and then like, like because I, I grew up in the suburbs where everyone like loved yeah. each other, like no no harm, nothing. Yeah. And then I can't imagine like teachers like not intervening or parents or anything. Like it was just like the streets yeah. out there. Well, I mean like in where I grew up in Falls Church, like Coolmore area, St. Anthony's, like it was a Catholic school. Oh, it was Catholic. Uh, right. The oh. first the first nine years was Catholic, right? I went from, until I was in third grade. So mm. the first nine years of my life, I lived around basically a Latino area. Mm. And then I went to St. Anthony's uh, public school. And there were white families there too, but like it was a lot of Latino families, you mm. know? And so there was a, I got, I could, it was my, my, you know, I was like, well, I wouldn't tell my dad sometimes either. Like uh, I wouldn't tell my mom sometimes mm. because I was embarrassed. Yeah. You know, I would just take the beatings, mm. you know? And so, and my dad was always caught up with this whole idea of trying to toughen me up. You gotta be a man. You gotta yeah. be a man, you know, stand up for yourself, stand up for yourself. So for his idea of standing up for myself though, was not fighting. It was to just kind of, you know, be stronger than them. Like, or be the better person. Be the better be, person, right? Yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff, which my dad had no concept of how to teach me, you know, uh-huh. cause it was, really hard for him and because my dad was working all the time too and mm-hmm. he didn't have the greatest upbringing like his his stepfather was an abusive alcoholic so uh-huh. he didn't teach him any parenting skills and his origin his uh, biological father died when he was 10 years old and that wow. really he loved his dad and that really affected him so uh-huh. my dad had a really really tough upbringing you know and so you said you were a latchkey <laughs> kid yeah, yeah kind of yeah I, and you and i feel like you and i are kind of similar okay and I I may be overreaching, <laughs> but I feel like because I was a latchkey kid too. I didn't yeah. know the term until like a couple of years ago. Yeah, me that, either. Until that, a few years ago, yeah. Yeah, until it's like oh, that's how it was. Yeah, yeah, that's how that's how I was. Like, um, my parents would drop us off at school in the morning, and then we would go. We would get home before they did. Yeah, we would like go through the garage. Yeah, and then just be home until they get home at like five. Exactly. And then I I thought that was like what everyone did <laughs> because it feel if it's it's like everyone has to go to work like right. a, a two income family. Yeah. That's, that's normal. Yeah. If so, it's what you know, yeah. how can you think there's any other way to exist? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so then was it just you and your brother or you and your well, sister? Well, it was me and my brother and my sister for a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, obviously, just like I said, seven years young. So like during elementary school, obviously she wasn't there. But yeah. like uh, when I got into middle school, she was a baby. So, so my mom ended up leaving uh, being a nurse mm-hmm. and she uh, became like a full-time mom during that time while my sister was doing that mm-hmm. and then went back to work as a hairdresser. Mm-hmm. And so- at that time, it was me being the primary, taking care of my brother and my sister while yeah, my mom was Yeah, so you had away. to be you had to be the adult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was really hard for me. I, I I was not prepared to be an older brother because I had a lot of my other stuff that I was working through. So it was like, as a kid, and so mm. it was really hard to kind of be like I I wish I could have been the quintessential older brother. You yeah, know, yeah, I tried. Uh-huh. I really tried hard, and but I made mistakes at times. And there's what else can I say? I made mistakes. And I mean, you don't know, you don't know. You really don't fucking know, man. And so I, I felt a lot of guilt to that for that for a long time. And I processed a lot of that in the mid two thousands. You know, do you ever wonder like, why are they picking on me? Like, no, it seemed obvious. They would tell me, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid. You're, uh, what you wear to school, you look dumpy, like all. Yeah. Oh, they would just like blatantly say like, Oh, "Oh, I'm picking on you because you're different. Well, right? they wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't be that eloquent. Yeah, yeah I know. But, yeah, <laughs> but sure, they would be like, you know, 
Um, and they used my name, which uh, they used to rhyme my name with other things. My original name before I changed it, they used to rhyme it with other things that symbolize fat. Uh, and so that's how they would. And they would, I remember distinctly one afternoon, they just circled around me during uh -huh. a recess. And just were like uh, doing recess of like Holy Catholic shit. school recess and yeah, just yeah. were just making fun of me the whole time. There was no other kids that they were making fun of? Were you like a group of like kids? I, I'm sure there were other kids, but uh -huh. I, for me, it was always singular. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wasn't like I gravitated to other nerdy kids who got beat up all the time too, you know? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that kind of thing. You know, uh -huh. everyone like... That's something in the fucking movies, or maybe it happens in real life, but I didn't experience it. We all are kind of alone on an island, yeah, you know, yeah. afraid to get caught out and get beat up. You know? Oh, yeah. In the movies where it's like all the nerdy kids are together and they yeah. like team up. There was no like... stand by me moment. <laughs> in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but did you, ha you had a couple of friends in like elementary school and sure. middle school? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure I did. In, in, in elementary school. Sure. I don't remember any of them, but I'm sure I did. And then. And in uh, um, middle school, I definitely developed some friendships. But in high school is where the, the, my friendships, my ability to develop friends really started to come to the front. That's yeah. when you stood up for yourself. And, and that's yeah. when you got more confident and worked out and mm -hmm. be, uh, got into acting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I got into acting. Um, I, had, I had thought about doing it in middle school, but I did track instead. Because uh -huh. that was my way of trying to, I was. Oh, I was so you're, you're trying to work out. Or I was trying, trying to, right. But I was, I was still fat, but uh -huh. like I was strong. So I could throw like the discus. Oh, okay. Or yeah. the shot put. Uh -huh. That's what they put me in. Right. Uh -huh. And so just to do something. Did right? you try football? No. Oh God. No. <laughs> I didn't try football. Uh, Be like a lineman if mm -hmm. you're just like a big lineman. No, because at the time I didn't, under, I didn't develop a taste for football till much later. Like, oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah. Much later, which we, we might get to, but like I, in high school is when I started to um, really kind of like, like I said, after the, the after I said on the Outlaw Nation podcast, like after my freshman year, that summer after I got my ass kicked one last time, my freshman year, my like I just, I think that the, that the summer between freshman and sophomore year, I worked out so hard and got into that position so that when I came back, I was, I, I just was more confident. Like, uh -huh. you know, you, these things happen, you transition, right? You yeah, all of a sudden yeah. you're like, oh, this can happen to my body. So yeah, yeah. I think because my dad had good genetics, he passed it on to me because my dad was a weightlifter in Argentina. Uh -huh. So like he he had the genetics i just had to shear the fat off mm -hmm. and and figure out how to do that and like you said once i set my mind to something i accomplish it uh -huh. you know i really do whether it's the varying degrees of accomplishment i still accomplish it yeah, you know? yeah and so um for me it was that and it was working out and doing all that. so when i came back i was like a whole other person like i was more relaxed i got my hair cut mm -hmm. i didn't my mom didn't dress me anymore see my mom dressed me in the, my whole freshman like all the way up to as a freshman yeah yeah my mom dressed like picked out clothes for every morning but did you did you try to say hey mom let me let me choose my own stuff sure but then it was like you know well no i know what's best for you and blah, right. blah, blah. so I, like i said bullied all around uh -huh. and wasn't oh, and, even and, bullied well, not, yeah but not bullied in that way of, like yeah, yeah. she was being mean about it they uh -huh. just like well, we tell you what to wear we tell you what to eat like that kind of thing they weren't mean parents uh -huh. they just thought they knew better right yeah. and so and i didn't have the strength within myself to fight back did they did they speak english and spanish yeah yeah yeah. Both. okay yeah, could, yeah. could you mention that they didn't want you learning a lick of english or a lick of spanish no no they wanted to learn me spanish they didn't want me learning english with a spanish accent oh yeah I, yeah, yeah, yeah oh because yeah. um uh, my my parents my parents parents didn't want them learning spanish at all wow yeah because wow. they said hey, you're going to learn english you're going to fit in you're going to be quote unquote whitewashed right just to just so kids don't pick on you yeah see it's a big thing man uh -huh. yeah we understood like growing up this people you know, people don't understand like how deep this shit goes with us who are of ethnic uh, origin. Like it's deep, uh -huh. you know, and we're, we're, we're raised a certain way. Nowadays, no, it's not that way. Nowadays, like you better speak Spanish first, you know, yeah. it's, it's now, that kind now of thing. It would have been so helpful for them to learn Spanish. Exactly. It's a different generation now. Nowadays, they, like you better learn Spanish first and all, they push all that stuff. And, and, you know, my, my mom and dad were always like, wanted me to speak English without an accent, but still learn Spanish. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was a big deal to them. Did you, so, but uh, you grew up like around Latinos? Yes. So did they ever say like, oh, you're not really Mexican or you're not really Latino? Uh, did other Latinos say that? Yeah, yeah. N why? Because, because I would get it. They're like, oh, you're so whitewashed that oh. you're, like, you're, you're not Mexican at all. And oh. I'm like, oh, I don't really care. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I... Uh, that only happened later. That can only I can only recall that happening later in my life. Yeah, because uh -huh. I'm not as brown as other Latinos, so I don't reckon I don't feel like that happened to me till later in life. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. my girlfriend thought you were Native American. You ever gotten that? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. People think that guy from uh, Hell or High Water. They think I look like him. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forget his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Gil, Gil something. Gil Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, Smoke down. Smoke down. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> yeah, so so then you found your solace in movies and television. Oh those, yeah, those, those are your friends. That was my escape, man. Yeah, Always, yeah. yeah. Since that, I was a kid. So did did you know like that you wanted to be in them? 
Or did you just like... Yeah, from an early age, I was a bit of a performer from an early age. Like I, I remember one of the first memories I have is that I had this Elvis Presley record. Uh, oh, the Dick Clark, right? There was just, just, there's two... My, my parents had these records, right? Kids, records are things they played back in the old days. <laughs> 45s, vinyls. Yeah, yeah those yeah. kinds of things, vinyls, exactly. <laughs> but we had this two, two vinyl uh, Dick Clark record and then this Elvis Presley record called Come On Everybody. And so I would perform for my aunts and uncles mm -hmm. at reun like reunions, what they call reunions, right? They all yeah. get together. Reunions. I would put on the record mm. and then I would perform as Elvis. Or like, I would, like sing? Or? Yeah, like sing oh, and wow. move uh -huh. like Elvis because I had watched Elvis growing up, you know, as a kid and uh, on TV. And so I would do the imitations. Mm -hmm. So I knew even as a young kid, like I wanted to do some sort of performance. You right? wanted to perform. Yeah. I, so, so it was then you, deep in me. So then you uh, auditioned for the school play. Oh yeah. In high school. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's Pirates of Ants. It's available to come out. I signed up. I got a time. And then throughout the rest of the day, I was like, I don't know if I should, maybe I shouldn't, you know, maybe I suck at it or do I really have the time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then as I was sitting at the locker room, I was just, uh, in the uh, in front of my locker, I was just going back and forth about it, going back. And then my friend Robert Doyle at the time came up and he was just like, do you want to do this to Roca? And I was like, I can't, I don't know, man. I, maybe I should just go. He's like, no, no, come on, we'll do it. We'll have fun, we'll do it. We'll see what happens. I'm auditioning too. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, uh -huh. so I got someone there. I'll go. Yeah. You know, and this is the year where like, you know, I became friends with a lot of people. I was dating all the time. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, it was yeah, it was good times. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was my. So I felt I felt okay. Let's go do this. Yeah. And then I got cast in it. And he didn't, uh -huh. which was my first experience of like professional envy, so to speak. You know, because uh, uh, your friend, yeah, because yeah. he kind of it really bothered him that he didn't get it, and I did. Oh really? And he had talked me into it. Yeah. But I mean, it, I guess like at that time, that, that's your life, but it's just a school play. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. now you can say just a school play, but at yeah, the yeah. time, it's like a big deal. But do you feel the same way when someone like uh, gets a better position than you? Like, are you envious of them when it, they when they get a better part or something? No, I'm not envious if I if I think they're good at it. Okay, right. I'm envious if I th or I or I want to find out. Like every actor wants to feel like, well, why did they get it over me? Right. Mm -hmm. You want the explanation, but you can still be happy for them. Yes, of course. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. 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 You're not like fuck that guy. That should be me. No. No. <laughs> No, I'm not like that. Uh -huh. I have a friend who's an actor. Um, I don't want to say his name because I want this is his process. But like, he he when he loses a part, mm -hmm. he watches that show or that com or that commercial uh -huh. or that movie, and wants to see what that other person did to validate whether he should not have been chosen or should have been chosen. So where you can say like, oh, I can't do that accent or right. something. Oh, right. okay. Oh, that guy's that guy's a terrible. Why did they choose him? That uh -huh. makes no sense. Mm. And so like, so I I've never gone that far. Like to me, it's like if I lose something, a role, I lose a role. That's it's, just you how don't it take is. a personal. No, I don't take it because it's so subjective, man. Yeah, Once yeah. you start to act, it's so subjective. Once you find out, and I've been in casting rooms, like I've been an assistant to a casting, or and I've done reality show casting. The shit that goes on behind doors, man, yeah. you have you have so little control of it as an actor. All you can do is prepare, do the best you can do in that room with, mm -hmm. the, time, with the time you have, get the fuck out and not think about it again. It really is. I've, I've been part of the casting too. And it's really yeah. like, oh, that guy, he, he looks good. Give him the part. Right. It's, it's no, like there's no bearing or no. nothing about it. No, or it's been like, hey, he reminds me of this guy that used to kick my ass in high school. Fuck him. I don't want him to have the part. Yeah, I can't yeah. work with that guy. Yeah. Or he reminds me, or she reminds me of a girlfriend I had. Fuck her. Or <laughs> yes, cast her. You know, it's just it's so random. Yeah. And, and, but they have that power because they're the casting directors. Exactly. So how long have you been in um, LA going at this? Since 2000. 2000. Oh, 17 years. Yeah. Wow. Well, almost 17. October would be 17. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when did you move out here? Because you, yeah. you always say you're older than everybody, but I feel like you're around <laughs> the same age. <laughs> October of 2000. Be, because uh, you said you went to the military for like eight years? Yeah, eight years. 1990 to 98. Oh, okay. But, but I went back to college in 97. How come you didn't go to college out of high school? I did. Oh, but yes. You, but you didn't finish? I didn't do well. Oh, okay. And so I left. What, why, I joined the military. What, were you not a good student? No, I just... wasn't. Yeah, well, I, I am a good student. I wasn't pursuing what I really wanted to do with my life. I was studying international politics because uh -huh. I was a model United Nations guy. Uh -huh. and I was big into that, model UN. And I was really good at that in high school. Like, we went to New York and won three times, wow. nationals, yeah. um, at Garfield High School. And uh, so I thought I could do that because my parents were really against me being an actor. Like they were really, really against me being an actor. And oh, they were still told, influence in my life. Uh, you told them and they said no. Yeah. Um, my dad and mom were like, this is, no, you're not going to be able to feed yourself. You're not uh -huh. going to make any money. You're going to be poor all your life. And I just was like, uh, okay, what can I study? 
international politics, mm-hmm. you know? And so I thought I'll explore that. And I had no idea what I was walking <laughs> into, like just no clue. College was so hard for me the first time around. Like what? it was, it just kicked the shit out of me, man. What college was it? Uh, I don't want to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it, it East Coast? East Coast, yeah. Oh, okay. And it was, a, the first year was a commuter college and uh-huh. the second year I was on campus. Oh, okay. And that's when the shit really hit the fan. It that just was, wasn't my jam. That was worse? Uh-huh. So then that's when you decided just to leave or just- Yeah, I was putting on weight and Mm -hmm. I was super depressed. Mm -hmm. And it was my first like kind of semi-suicide attempt. And I just was, yeah, I kind of, I'd taken some pills and and then I got pumped. My stomach got pumped and whatever. And so like that was- that was a situation and, and I just, I was just super depressed, man. And I was incredibly unhappy and putting on the weight made me feel again, like I was back in elementary school uh, yeah. and, and I just felt so ugly and unattractive and I couldn't pick up a girl to save my life. Where in high school, I had been going, going out with a lot of women because uh-huh. I was like, all this new confidence was really great. Yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't ask a woman out. I would like, or a, a teenager, like whatever you want to say, like yeah, yeah. I was in high school, I would just kiss them first, then ask them out. <laughs> yeah. That was my process. But, the, but you were so good looking and so charming. <laughs> that I don't know about all that, but like the, for the girls that I would, like I would go after. Yeah. I would like, yeah, I would like spend time talking to them. And so, and I would sense an attraction uh, and then I would just kind of like kiss uh-huh. and then they'd be like, Oh, it would be surprised them. And I said, well, do you want to go out sometime? Would you want to go out? And then it'd be like, yeah, well, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. So, so, but then in college you just lost. No, that. Yeah. I lost yeah. all of that. Like I couldn't do it for anything. I was so terrible at it because I didn't know how to have game. Like I didn't understand what the fuck it, game was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. At college, I had no game at all. And so like the the whole, like the girls are all different, like from high yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They seem to be like, it's like a video game. It was like a whole nother, it was like a next level. Yeah, and yeah. I was not, I didn't have all the tools necessary. And I, my game kept g- going game over, <laughs> came over all the time. And I was so frustrated, you know? And so it just was a, it was a tough time for me all around. And I think because I chose the wrong college, I chose the wrong major. I got into a fraternity I should never gotten to. And just had some bad experiences there. And I was like, yeah, I got to get the fuck out of here. And I was managing a video store at the time uh-huh. to to pay for college. Uh-huh. Um, and this recruiter had come in as a guest or as a, sorry, as a, as a customer all the time. And uh, one day, for whatever reason, uh, he came in and I just said to him, how quickly can I be on a bus to basic training? Mm-hmm. And he said, three weeks. Wow. And I said, Okay. Do I need to sign anything? Do I need to talk to anybody? He's like, well, you could if you want to talk to your parents, but you're over 18, you don't have to. Yeah. And I was 19 at the time. So I said, okay, fuck it. So you didn't, you didn't tell your parents? I did not tell my parents until after I signed the contract. Oh, but before you left? Yes, of course. Okay. Before yeah. I left, yes. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. No, uh, I, yeah, I, I, my, I, my friend's name uh, uh, was Rob. I think Rob was his name. And he drew, we went over to the uh, uh, recruiter's office. I took the ASVAB. Mm-hmm. I scored like a 96 or something like that, which means I could, which I, they said you can choose any branch of the military you want to go into with a 96. Is that like a smarts thing? Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I was like, okay. And so, but I chose an army because the recruiter was an army. Uh huh. But in retrospect, I really think I should have chosen Air Force. I think Air Force prepares you better for the real world. Uh-huh. Um, and so I just, uh, I went in there and so, and I signed the contract, eight years, reserves. Yeah, yeah. I never went full-time active. And so, um, then so, I went home and 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 uh, told my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so what is reserves? I mean, you never went overseas? Yeah, I never went overseas. Oh, okay, so yeah, you were just yeah. always in the States. Yes. But yes. then you can be like on call like anytime. Yes. Is that what yes. that means? Well, oh. like the first, you do your basic training, which is two, month, two months. Uh-huh. Then you do AIT training, which is three months. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you have to do one week in a month uh-huh. and then two weeks out of the year in summer. Uh-huh. So you're at a base. So every, every there's one weekend every month you have to go and serve your two days at, on the base, right? And uh-huh. do your things and be trained and work on all those kinds of things and do mm-hmm. military exercises. And then of course, when you go for the two weeks, you're going out and bivouacking, but with call it bivouacking, which is where you go, you set the tents up, you do all that kind of stuff. You're out there in the military, you're doing, you're taking shits and holes, you're, you're doing, oh. you're eating <laughs> MREs, you're pretending like you're out on an actual exercise, military exercise. Yeah. Uh, so did, did that help you? Did it like help build your confidence back? Sure. Oh, the military did. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, oh, that's yeah. exactly what you needed. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. I don't regret it for a second. Like it was a very tough conversation. My mom cried the whole time when uh-huh. I told her. My dad was super upset. Yeah. And he was just like, yeah, I don't know how you think you're going to survive in the military. You can't even take discipline from me. Because mm-hmm. because the combination of me becoming more confident in high school uh-huh. uh, uh, led to a lot of problems with my dad because I started to push the boundaries. I would stay out till 1 a.m. Oh, to wow. it. Yeah, at would 15 years old. Yeah, 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 I would fight back. Uh-huh. And I had a friend at the time who was like involved, ironically, with this Baptist youth group. Uh-huh. And so I got involved with him, with him and we would like go out till 1 or 2 a.m. 
Would you be drinking around yeah. that? Yeah. Well, they would drink. I never did any of that till I was much older. But uh-huh. they would drink and they would do this. I was more about like getting to know the girls and being out there talking to people. Uh-huh. And like just to me, it was just great to just kind of like be adventurous, you know, uh-huh. and then also push the limits with my parents. You know, mm. I just, I was a bit of an asshole you know, through that time. And <laughs> to your parents? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah, yeah. My dad was like super angry. We would have these hellacious fights about it verbally, you know, and so it just was not a good time. But I just need, I was like pushing boundaries because yeah. I need to establish myself. You needed to find yourself, right. like your identity, like who am I? Who, exactly. What am I going to do with my life? And it must have been such a culture shock for my parents because here was this weak kid who got beat up all the time. All yeah. of a sudden now he's got balls and strength. And he's pushing back and fighting and, yeah, you know, yeah. he's lifting weights. He's stronger. Yeah. He's dating girls. Like I, my first girlfriend was a 19 year old woman with a child. Well, wait, how old are you? 15. <laughs> but I lied to her because oh, I, because I, because of how strong I was and how I looked. Oh, yeah, yeah. I told her I was 18 years old uh-huh. and I was working in, it was my first job at, uh, in Dale city called the job lot push cart, uh-huh. which is a defuncto company or store now. But like I was in the back stacking shelves, like yeah, yeah. I was stacking stuff on shelves and stuff. So I would work there, um, and then go to school. So where'd you meet her? Uh, there she was a cashier oh she worked there yeah she worked there yeah Yeah, she's great and and we just hit it off and i lied to her Uh. (laughs) because i to me she was like you know this kind of and she was a redhead i have a thing for redheads like crazy and she was exotic looking she was this beautiful redhead to me at the time and uh i didn't understand she was like i'm separating from my child uh, i didn't understand what any of that man i was 15 (laughs) right but i just kept shaking my head going yeah "Yeah, no totally get it totally get it yeah i'm here for you blah, blah blah really supportive you know I am that way. I'm very supportive yeah. to the women I oh, okay. date, to the women I see. Like I'm, so, I'm like, I pursue your dreams. I'm behind you a thousand percent. I uh-huh. totally get it. So you weren't right? just trying to like just bang her. You were, no, you were, you were just trying. You were trying she to was, date her. You wanted to date her. You liked her. Yes, I okay, did. Yeah. She was my first. Oh, okay. First, she was. I, I lost my virginity to her in the back of a green Chevelle on a rainy night in Dale City, Virginia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Of course, yeah, it's true. And it was. I'm mean, no shame about that. We're yeah. all men. We have our times, and that was my first uh, time. And she was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah she was did, great. But did that develop into like a a, a deeper relationship mm-hmm. or was it just once one time thing no it developed into a deeper relationship the uh-huh. problem was what's that i told my parents about it uh-huh. and my mom was super now here's the deal here's i my mom is a piece of iron and she's uh-huh. the sweetest person you, uh-huh. she is the first one to laugh the first one to hug you the first one she is one of the sweetest people you meet on the planet mm-hmm. but my mom is also like driven Mm-hmm. Like when she something is, ha- she is like, when she wants to do something, she will do it. Mm-hmm. She's a, she's a Leo. Mm-hmm. So man, oh man. So, um, so what did she do? She confronted this girl in the, uh, at the store. She, so you, she didn't find out you told her. No, I told her. Yeah, yeah. And I told, and she was like, wait, how old is she? And mm-hmm. I, I thought I was being like, you know, cocky. Yeah. yeah. Telling my mom, oh yeah, she's 19 mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've, I'm 15. I get a 19 year old girl, blah, blah, blah. So what did your dad, well, sorry, what did your dad say? My dad was more like cool about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's like a good boy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Men are men. Yeah. But my, my mom was super upset. And by the way, I don't know anything about statutory rape or anything. I should, you know, I don't know yeah, anything yeah. about this. Right. I'm just like thinking I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I really did care about her. Like I loved her. Like as much as a 15 year old person could love somebody, you mm-hmm. know, I loved her. And um, we had, this has been going on for months. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, when I told my mom, my mom was like, and I didn't know this. My mom like volunteered to take me to work that day. She took me to work and I'm working in the back. And my mom is like, walks them all for like an hour. So she's sure I'm not like <laughs> roaming around the front or whatever. And then she goes into the store and she purposely gets into her line, uh-huh. to this girl's line and this woman's line. And uh, walks up to her and is like, uh, hey. And she goes, oh, hello. And she says, do you know who I am? And she goes, no. And he says, I'm John Roca's mother. And she mm-hmm. goes, she goes, oh, 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 nice to meet you. Uh-huh. She goes, yeah, it's very nice to meet you too. You're blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, I am. And she goes, okay. Do you know my son's 15 years old? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, man. <laughs> totally killed, totally ruined it, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to she like kind of rolled with it and was like, oh my God, I didn't know. I'm uh-huh. so sorry. He told me he was 18. She goes, no, he's 15. He's 15. <laughs> you know? And she was just like, oh, I didn't know. I just, I'm so sorry. I, Mr. Roy, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Blah, blah, blah. She's like, I just want you to know because, you know, I, I don't want him to get into trouble. I don't want you to get into trouble. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so there's a whole, so, so. So it's like psychological yeah, shit. Really? Like my mom is, yeah. 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 Well, you know, women, women, <laughs> uh, you know, so women operate a whole nother level. Yeah, it wasn't, it was, yeah. she wasn't like confronting her. She was just like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll give you this information. You do with it what you want. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. you know, women operate on seven levels, dude. Yeah, like, yeah. Dudes are too stupid. We have two or three levels tops. <laughs> You know, even Neil deGrasse Tyson probably always had what two or three levels. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, so then that night she 
my that girl took me uh, home purposefully. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like she's like, I'll drive you home. Your mother. I, 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 was, I told my mom. I said, Call my mom. I said, Mom, uh, this girl's gonna drive me home. She's like, Okay, okay. But you had no idea that they no, talked. I, yeah, no, no yeah. clue. Yeah, yeah. So she's driving me home, and then she says, like, she drives. She pulls over somewhere, and she says, Hey, your mom came into the store, and I, my fucking heart dropped <laughs> into my stomach. And she goes, and she was like getting money from the bank at the time, and she goes, um, Why didn't you tell me you were fifteen? And yeah. I was like. And I just started crying, like I just yeah. impulsively started crying because I cared about it. I didn't want to yeah. lose her. And she just was like, "Yeah, I didn't know. You know, your mom told me that. But, but you know, I could get in trouble. You know, statutory rape is. I could uh-huh. go to jail. Blah blah blah." Yeah. And I was like, "I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. No, I just care about you. I didn't want to lose you. And I really cared about you. And I thought you would leave me if you didn't know how old I was. And blah blah blah." And she's like, "Well, if you put me in a really bad position, because I do care about you, and I don't want to hurt you, and I don't want us to stop, but I don't, but I don't know what to do." Uh-huh. So we tried to keep going for like a a few a couple of weeks two or three weeks after but she, it just was too much that's too weird for her yeah like, it was too weird 15. for her yeah he's, 15, he's a sophomore with a child <laughs> divorcing yeah. you know all of that <laughs> to her credit and uh-huh. this is no bullshit um she became one of the top people at the department of homeland security wow so i respect her very much and she we we had some kind of contact a few years ago but then we kind of fell off in contact she's i don't know what she's doing now but mm-hmm. We had come and we randomly ran into each other at a Sears optical place a few years ago when I was home for Christmas. Uh-huh. And, and she, I recognized her immediately and wow. she didn't recognize me for a little bit. And then she sent a message back while I was in the uh, optometrist's chair uh-huh. through the nurse to be like, tell John to wait. I did recognize him, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so we had, we had dinner and we had a great conversation just reliving all of that that happened and laughing about it. Yeah. And you can laugh about it now. now it's right. pretty ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and massive respect to her to like go from a cashier living in a trailer park, divorcing with one child. Wow. To where she really got really uh, buckled down and worked hard and got multiple degrees and became one of the top people at the Department of Homeland Security. Wow. Yeah. Do you and think so- it was that moment where she realized she was dating a 15 year old <laughs> <laughs> where she had to change her life drastically? <laughs> Maybe who can say? <laughs> she never said that to me. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that she still wanted to hey, like see me when we ran into each other was yeah, a great. Yeah. That was great. Uh-huh. We had a fucking awesome dinner down in uh, Alexandria and had a really great time getting to know each other. And, and again, you yeah, know, yeah. And she was very happy. Like I was pursuing acting because she uh-huh. knew that was something that really deepened me back then too. So she was supportive of you back then. Very very supportive. Yeah yeah. 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 And so, you know, so that kind of stuff. So it's, it's just funny little things that happen to you. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So yeah. So going back to college. Yeah. When. I don't know why you don't, you don't want to say the, the college you went to because of, yeah. because of the whole, like the school or the people there? The school and yeah. the people. Was it, was it the like faculty or anything that was like tough on you or like what was going on through there? No, it wasn't the faculty, man. I, there's, there was a guy who had a hard on for me and he, he was making my life a living hell there. And you had another bully with you. I left. Uh-huh. And when I left my mom, my mom, yeah. once again, my mom confronted that guy. Yeah. And this is what my mom did. My mom went to confront that guy. Um, under a different name uh-huh. because he wasn't supposed to talk to my mom. And so- Why wasn't he supposed there was, to- There was just stuff that happened and, uh-huh. and there was some bullshit that happened. Uh-huh. And uh, my mom was like, and set up a, a meeting with him. Mm-hmm. I have a, my son is thinking of coming to Jordan, no. to this to college. And I was wondering if blah, blah, blah. And so she walks in and she says, and my mom pulls it again. She yeah. says like, you know who I really am? <laughs> like, no bullshit. And she took this guy to town, man. Yeah, she yeah. said, my son is blah, blah, blah. And my son is going to be something because fuck you and fuck this place, what you did to him and what you guys tried to do to him. You guys railroaded him. You did that. And in her way of saying it, right. And yeah. she just went off on the guy and she said, you'll see, you're going to be nothing. Uh-huh. And my son is going to be something. You just, you just, you just watch, Yeah, you know? And so it was like, I didn't know she had done this. I didn't yeah. know she'd even planned to do this. And but she told you afterwards? Yeah, she told yeah, me yeah. afterwards. Like years later. Oh, you, yeah, 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 yeah. She didn't tell me when she did it. She told me years later. So like that began a process of me like kind of wandering around for a while. Cause yeah. that, that really damaged me. What happened there really damaged me yeah, you, all around. As opposed to just leaving, you said you had a semi-suicide attempt. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that was before I got in the, yeah. Right before that was what yeah. sparked me getting into the military. Yeah, so, yeah. well, I like, I just want to, I just want to know like yeah. what gets to that point of like, Hey, I'm just want to, I just want to end everything. Well, here's my belief. I think some people are born with this, man. I think it's something in our chemistry. Some it's of a, us have this thing that it's easier. It's, how would I say this? I want to say this correctly. I think it's something, some of us are born with the proclivity for it from birth. Like the possibility of it seems more uh, uh-huh. Available to us as a solution, as a solution than uh-huh. other people. I think other people would rather be homeless than kill themselves. Yeah. I, if I ever become homeless, I'm living on the street. 
I will absolutely end my life. There's no fucking way I'm living on the street. Yeah. And so there's no point. Uh -huh. But other people can. Other mm -hmm. people think it's just about enduring. It's about surviving. Yeah. yeah. And to me, it's about quality of life. That's and yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And so like, if that ever happens to me, better believe it. There's not even a moment's hesitation. But like, have you? Has there any been? Has there been anybody else in your family that has done it? No. No. Not that I know of. Because no. I, I know I know a couple of my cousins have done it. Wow. But like, but like second cousins. Oh wow. So okay. I think. Yeah. So I, I can I can understand that it, you think like it is like a, a proclivity. You say yeah. Like people think it's a solution. But yeah, I think it's a chemistry thing. It's uh -huh. a body chemistry. Some people are born with that thing uh -huh. that is like once they conceive of it, it doesn't seem inconceivable to them as a, as an option. So and, it seems possible. It seems like hey, this is the only thing I can do. Right. Uh -huh. This seems like the easiest way out uh -huh. to end the pain, uh -huh. to end the suffering, to end the sadness, uh -huh. to end the despondency. Yeah, it feels that way. Like you get that point where, and this is like, once again, I'm 19. So to me, everything's dramatic. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And um, so to me, I was just like thinking, well, this is, this is it. Fuck it. I'm, I'm, I can't do it. I can't hold on. I can't do it. Like, I was meant for something more and I'm not going to achieve it. And fuck it, I'm out. Uh -huh. And that's how I felt. And I, I felt like no other options. And, mm -hmm. it's not, and it's not from bad parenting or whatever. Like my dad, mom tried, to, they were great. Like they tried to teach me everything I need to have to function in life. Uh -huh. I just didn't listen. Mm. I was in undisciplined, which is why when I joined the military, everything changed for me. Yeah. You know, I really got disciplined. Like I went down, I draw, I lost like 20 pounds in the military. Mm. I came out of there chiseled at 195 uh -huh. and I was ripped and it was not a problem. Like I even hooked up in basic training. Like, and you're not supposed to hook up with anybody in basic training. What do you mean? You hook up with a woman? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I really did that. So and, you're always all, all about the girls. Well, <laughs> I like women. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I think, they're, I think they're beautiful and they're fantastic and they're fun to talk to and I enjoy getting to know women. I, I love women, man. Uh -huh. So yeah, to me, it was like, yeah. I feel like you bring dating up a lot. You brought it oh, up. Oh, do I? I'm sorry. No, no, not, not, not like a bad way, but I feel like you, in the, in your outlaw podcast, you brought it up like three times. And Did, then, I really? <laughs> <laughs> Did I really? Did I really? Maybe it's just in my oh. head. But then, and then also sorry, like man. I wanted to record tomorrow and you said you're going on a date tomorrow. Yes, I am. Yeah. So you're still trying to find like the right woman. Sure. Yeah. But I think, yeah. And I, but like, I really believe it's all in God's hands. Like I, I have progressed as a person. I, you know, like I, I love who I am man. Mm -hmm. and I, I know my heart is a good heart and I know it, you know, I, I'm, I treat people well and I'm, I'm, I care about people who come into my sphere. Like it's a really, it's a real thing, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and some people are like weird about it because like, I don't let them in. Some people I don't let in. And no matter how hard they try, they're not going to get in. There are people oh. that I can sense that I let in and there are people I don't. Uh -huh. And there's a reason for that. Oh, you, you said know? it's that thing of the, the connecting thing of like, oh, she's lying to me. She doesn't want this to work out thing. You were talking about it earlier. About what? Of, of, I don't no, know. I'm talking about overall relationships, friendships uh. and dating, whatever. Like mm -hmm. to me, it's like once I... Like with Perry, like Perry's a great example. Perry, uh -huh. I love to pieces. From the moment we met, uh -huh. I was like, this one I'm going to be friends with for yeah. a long time. And that only has grown exponentially as I've gotten to know Perry. And Perry really cares about me as a person. Mm -hmm. We've had these great conversations. When we were at the Critics' Choice Awards, like it was an awesome night hanging out with my friend and we got to be ourselves all night and shoot the shit. And she got to be nervous around people. I got to be like, I don't give a shit. Let's go talk to him <laughs> about people. We drank. We had a great time. So you know? what is it about her that makes it like a friendship? She, right has, a, she has a genuine sweetness. Uh -huh. And I'm an empath, which is a kind of a curse. And I'm emotionally intelligent. So I sometimes can read people uh -huh. uh, quicker than other people. Uh -huh. And it can be good or bad. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, once I sense from someone that I can't trust them, I'm never going to be able to trust them unless something mm. happens really powerfully that changes my mind. Uh. I just can I initially know. Have you ever been wrong about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, every yeah. once in a while, like every once in a while, uh, like I said, situations happen or conversations happen in certain moments. You're like, oh, I didn't know. Mm. You know, like some people have commented on Outlaw Nation podcast, like I hated you until I listened to this podcast. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know you had all this behind you. And it's like, yeah. Or some people were like, I've had a few people DM me and apologize for calling me a social justice warrior because they're like, I get it now. Yeah. Listening to your podcast, I get where you were coming from. Oh, that's what they need the explanation behind right. it as opposed to the 20 minutes you're on Collider movie talk exactly. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's easier to um, take the shortcut in thinking. Uh -huh. I think this person's just just an empty vessel repeating shit. And yeah, it's yeah. like, no, you got to know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah. So for me, that's that's kind of a thing. And yeah, I've had some amazing relationships. I've had some great relationships. I've met some amazing women. I've experienced amazing women in my life. Uh -huh. 
So if I, I bring it up only because I'm single, like other people bring up married all the time and <laughs> oh, bring yeah, up yeah. Yeah, their girlfriends or boyfriends all the time. It's, yeah, just, yeah. it's just, it's a natural way of speaking, you know? And to me, I'm, yeah, I'm always in pursuit of, and I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want, I have that desire. Uh-huh. I just am a late bloomer, man. Like yeah. I've always come to stuff later in life mm-hmm. than other people, you mm-hmm. know, which is weird because I, I see now people get married at like 20, 25 years old. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. You know, like, this is so strange to me. That's you strange know? to I'm me. I'm still like figuring my world out, Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so. But, but do you feel like the military held you back in that regard when you, when you, like the no. eight years of your life has gone to the military? No, no, I don't think so at all. I think if anything else, women, some women like to marry a military guy, you uh, know, they see stability there. You yeah. know? And so for me, no, I don't think it held me back at all. I think it, I owe a lot to the military because mm-hmm. I also met two really amazing friends who kind of helped me grow through my twenties to become mm-hmm. a man, you know, and we played basketball all the time. Like we would go and play basketball in DC, but I mean, that's where I learned shit talk was, was on a court. Uh-huh. And so like, I didn't know what shit talking was until yeah, I started yeah. playing basketball and like, you got to learn to shit talk in yeah. DC, Virginia, Maryland. That's how it works, man. You yeah, got to play ball and have fun. Yeah. You got to stand up for yourself. You got to stand yeah. up for yourself. And learn how to take it. it as yes, opposed you do. to just like uh, getting angry and beating the shit out of somebody. Which happens on the court sometimes too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I never threw a punch, but I've been punched on the court. Really? Oh yeah. For shit talking? Yes. Yeah. I was good at it. <laughs> Where do you think these promos come from? I just I didn't, mean, I just grew yeah. up by the ground. Yeah. Like I learned to do this playing ball and I uh, mean, I would infuriate people. Yeah. yeah. Cause I would go like to the minutia of the stuff they were doing. So then what, what happened after you threw a punch at you? I would just laugh or if it was a really, I would just kind of stand there. I could always take a punch, man. Yeah, yeah. I got a strong chin. I uh-huh. can always take a punch. I've never gone down. But you never, you never threw a punch back? No. Oh, no. of course not. No, 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 no. Because there's a joy in causing them to, to break. Cause then their <laughs> friends get in and kind of, you know, like, uh, yeah, oh yeah. dude, sorry, sorry. You know, blah, blah, blah. Like when I played interleague games, I've had people like throw balls at me coming out of bounds. Like they threw them <laughs> directly at my, f- yeah. my face or my head or whatever. And it caused a technical foul. We get a free throw. Uh, so yeah. But you enjoy being that guy. You enjoy- I, I did back then, yes. Oh, okay. Not anymore. No. Getting no, a rise out of people. No, 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 no. no. That's not my jam at all. I mean, for the schmodown, it's great to recall that because that's yeah. what that is when I'm doing the outlaw. It's, it's wrestling. Yeah, 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 basically. And it's recalling stuff I did in my, in my 20s, uh-huh. you know. But And I've gone too far a couple of times on the schmodown stuff and people have pulled me aside and been like, hey man, don't bring this person up. Don't bring that person up. I oh, really yeah. appreciate if you wouldn't reference this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, great, no problem. I have no problem doing it because I understand that. Mm-hmm. But like when I was back then, I mean, I used everything. I mean, I used everything because you're trying to unsettle them. You're trying to win the game, you know. And <laughs> it's just a basketball game. It's just a basketball game. Well, <laughs> when we're on the court, it ain't just a basketball game, you yeah, know. Yeah. And 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 for us, like at the time, uh, it was my friend David Anderson who's in the military and Brian Benson. Like we were like fucking. That was a three. It was a threesome, man. We were yeah, running. Yeah. We were running on the court at uh, base at uh, at Fort Meade in Maryland. We were always running you were and gunning even- wherever we could play. Man, it was a blast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so after after that you go to you go back to college. Yeah, I, t- I had you, some time. What, where, what, what was your major for at college? Co- as theater. You you went back as a theater yes. major. Okay, yeah, yeah, I started going to to night school like at uh, uh, at uh, Northern Virginia Community College. Uh-huh. I started studying and coming back because so like I said that that the the experience at the other college damaged me for a couple of years and and um. Uh, I kind of had to slowly walk back to it, mm-hmm. and I and I I was working managing bookstores. Back to me, I was managing stuff again, mm-hmm. and uh, making my money. Sometimes living at home, sometimes living in an apartment, just trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, man. And I was still doing military stuff, but it wasn't like full time, so mm-hmm. I had to pay bills. Yeah, so yeah. I was doing all that, and that's when I really started to discover also my love of film more powerfully. Independent movement, independent film, like all this kind of like I was renting DVDs all the time, or blue or uh, VHSs mm. all the time, yeah, yeah. And watching movies upon movies upon movies. Once again, my solace when I'm lost is films and television. Yeah, it just, it's your escape. It is. It is my escape. Uh-huh. It's where I feel the most alive and knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. And so um, for a little while, I just wandered around and then uh, I went back to, and then I, I started going back to uh, community college to get my A degree. And I had this amazing teacher because I was really not sure if I could do it because I almost failed out of my first college. And not, uh, not do college at all or or a theater specifically? Yeah, college. Oh, college. College it's period. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wasn't sure I could do college at all. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I had this English teacher, Dr. Ryan, I think her name was. She, we did this program where we analyzed a Maya Angelou book and she was like, she she was the only male she allowed on the show mm-hmm. to talk about it and or was it a Toni Morrison book? It was either Maya Angelou or Toni Morrison. I think maybe it been a Toni Morrison book. And we talked about it. And when I was done, she's like, "That's what I mean, John. You have this ability to analyze something. You have this ability to look at things mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't have. And I'm encouraging you not to quit. Mm-hmm. You can do college. You can do this. And so she's the reason." 
that mm-hmm. I stayed in college and got my A degree and went to Florida State. Like she is the reason that I stayed and did it and yeah. f- persevered and got my A degree and, and 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 went to Florida State. That's what I feel like a lot of people need, just that like encouragement, uh-huh. just that one person to be like, hey, you can do this. Yeah. Because a lot of people, especially in their 20s, are lost. They don't have mm-hmm. a role model or somebody to just say, hey, go in this direction. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. they're adopting survival strategies just to survive those where they're at in their lives at the time. But it isn't going to lead to anything, uh-huh. right? Yeah. So, so then you go back to Florida. You go to Florida. Why Florida? Yeah. Um, I got my A degree, and then I took a year off uh-huh. and went to Charlottesville, Virginia. I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, with my best friend, mm-hmm. who is he's pretty big up in the government now in Charlottesville, Virginia. And we were uh, he was a sports anchor at the time, and he's like, "Come." I was like, "I don't know. I've graduated my A degree, but I don't want to stay here." Like. Is there, can I work with you at the television station? Okay. He goes, there's a job that's opened up. You can apply for it. If you get it, then you can move in with me. We can, you know, pal around for a year. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So while I'm there, you know, I learn a lot about working at a television station, but also like I start to get my confidence back to take this chance, mm-hmm. right? And so I apply to uh, uh, Florida State and Montana State. Uh-huh. And uh, because I wanted to get as far away from Virginia as possible. I didn't mm. think about West Coast. Like in my you, mind, I couldn't do West Coast. You never thought LA? No, 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 no. It was too far. Uh-huh. In my mind, too far. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind, I'm from a small town in Virginia. So in my mind, like this, you know. Uh-huh. So Florida State seemed right because they had a good acting program. And I had been kind of a Seminoles fan already. Uh-huh. Uh, so to me, it seemed possible. Uh, and then Montana State had a really strong Shakespeare program and a very strong public television access channel that you could do shows on there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh And so I explored both. And then my dad and I drove down, because my dad and I had kind of made up by this point. Like a a, a lot of my anger had dissipated and I had become more, more believing in myself. Oh, you guys did have to fall, have a falling out? Oh yeah. We, we, we had some pretty bad fight. Like there's a year where I lived at the house where we didn't talk. You, you lived together and you lived together and speak. Yeah, that's a Latino thing, man. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that that doesn't make sense to me because I had a friend that she lives with her yeah. her dad. They don't speak at all. But, yeah. I, but I'm like, you go to you go to the same fridge. Listen, yeah. that's a Latino thing, man. Yeah, like when you cross me, uh-huh. if you cross me, we don't talk again until you apologize uh-huh. or you or you make it up to me. We don't talk again. I have enough friends I talk to. I have enough people I talk to. Yeah. I don't need to have you in my life. Yeah, you have that's your 65 friends. Yeah, yeah. my 65 <laughs> friends. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just how it is. This is how I'm built for better or worse. Yeah, I, but yeah. I like to resolve stuff. Yeah, yeah. But if I didn't do anything wrong and you did and you screwed me over, you lied to me or you betrayed me with information to other people, no fucking way are we, am I am I coming to you going, but hey, let's smooth this over. Uh, no, no, no. So, but you're able, if they say something, if they apologize, you're able to forgive. Absolutely. Oh, okay. If they come at me and they apologize, hey, listen, this and this, and then I'm very understanding because I've made mistakes. Uh-huh. And when I make mistakes, I go and apologize. That's mm-hmm. how it works. That's how my life works. So then who whose fault was it between you and your father? I think it was just us. Just just us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, who, who is it when you fight with your parents? Yeah, like, yeah. It's just always like it's both sides, I think. So then know? who made the first step in resolving it? Uh, my dad, because I got into a car accident that mm-hmm. shattered uh, a, rear, a rear view mirror shattered in my eye. Whoa. And I saw, if you can look there, I have like scars on my eyebrows, in uh-huh. my eyebrow here. And that's from a rear view mirror shattering in there. And my dad came, it was at the time where we weren't talking. Uh-huh. And my dad came to the hospital with my mom. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was blind because they had put like a thing, because it happened on a, on a one lane road uh, coming back from college when I was still going to that college. Was it just like a freak, a- freak accident? Yeah, freak they- accident. Oh, wow. Total freak accident. Mm-hmm. Like uh, he, cro- I think he crossed the, over the lane and swipe swiped my rear view mirror and uh-huh. just shattered into my eye. Wow. And uh, I was lying uh, there. And they had called my parents, which I didn't know. And I was like so out because I was in shock. Yeah, yeah. You know, I passed out on the hood of the car after I'd called the um, ambulance uh-huh. or had the the guy call the ambulance. What had happened was they'd sideswiped the rear. So my eye immediately exploded into blood. Wow. I'm screaming, looking in the rear view mirror, going, holy shit, because there's just blood all over my face. There's, uh-huh. there's pain from the shards of glass that are in my cornea. Yeah. And I just like lost it for 10 seconds. And then I said, there's a Shell gas station a mile and a half away. If you can keep it together to get there, they'll call the ambulance and then you'll get home. And so you're, you're telling yourself that? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Once mm. again, this determination to survive. <laughs> whatever stuff I have, uh-huh. whatever times, I still have a desire to live yeah. and to survive. And so that kicked in and I was like, okay. And so I drove straight to the Shell gas station. I remember I get out of my car. 
the guy is freaking out because it's late at night. The guy's yeah. freaking out. And I said to him, call the ambulance. I've just been in an accident. I got sideswiped. I'm going remember, remember, to use your bathroom. Can you give me the key? I'm going to try to put water. Because yeah. at this point, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to lose the eye. I have to work on death. I'm going to have a patch for the rest of my life. Yeah. But I went in there and I started pouring water into my eye to pull all the ga- all the glass out of my eye. You were able to pull the glass. Out well, of your I eye? like like water it out, like yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, a bunch of water going through, and and you know, and <laughs> the bathroom, gas station bathroom, ain't the cleanest place to do that with. But like, yeah. I had to do it, and it was getting it, and, and then I I uh, felt like it was like I cleaned all the blood off, and I felt like it looked okay. Uh-huh. Um, unbeknownst to me, I had two pieces of glass in an X shape uh-huh. in my cornea. Like I didn't, uh-huh. that's where the pain was coming from, but all the other exterior glass, I was able to get out of my eye. So were you in one. shock this whole time? I, I was in shock. But were you feeling the pain at all? I was feeling the pain to a degree, but uh-huh. I was more focused on the adrenaline of surviving. Uh-huh. And so when I come out, I say to him, did you call the game? He says, yeah, they're on their way. They're on their way. And then I, I said, okay, good. And then I collapsed on the hood of my car and passed out. And that's it. That's and, all and, you remember. And, and then I wake up. The next thing I remember is waking up in the ambulance, uh-huh. being wrapped up. Oh, so you you didn't wake up in the hospital. You woke no, up in the ambulance. I woke up in the ambulance. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, "What's going on?" They told me, and they had a patch on my eye. Oh, they had a big thing on my eye, a bandage, and all the stuff on my eye already. And they were talking talking to me. They're taking me to the hospital, and everything like that. So, and so what were they saying? Like, just just relax. Calm yeah, down. You relax. You're not going to lose your eye. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't say anything like that. They uh-huh. were lose their eye. They were like, "We did the best we could. We'll see what happens. Blah blah blah, and we'll get you there." And so I, yeah, so I went to the hospital. So then you get there and then your, your father shows up. And my father shows up, yeah, a little bit after and with my mom. And I can't see, right? Because uh-huh. both my eyes are wrapped up at this point. And, Why did they have to wrap up the other eye? Uh, I think was they just want, stuff? yeah, there oh. was like, yeah, they just didn't want to take a chance of anything. So both, uh, so I couldn't see. And so they were just taking precautions. Uh-huh. Um, and my mom, and I heard my mom, like my mom come in. And then I heard my dad, and my dad took my hand. When my dad took my hand, man, I started crying. Yeah. yeah. I just started crying, just fucking bawling. Because I was like, I could have died. Yeah. yeah. And here I have this issue with my dad, like this unresolved shit with my dad, and I could have died with it unresolved. Yeah. You know? And yeah, it was a really emotional moment. So then you you realize like, hey, like whatever we went through, it's not worth yeah. not speaking to each yeah, other. Yeah, like yeah. we have to get through this shit together. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. And that's so, how we put it together. And that's when I, you know, we, we drove down to Tallahassee to explore Florida State uh-huh. uh, in 90, in 90, the summer of 97. We drove down there and immediately uh, I knew. Yeah. As soon as we got out of the car, I was like, yep. This is where I belong. <laughs> you you belonged in Florida? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I belonged in Florida, belonged to us. I, I can't explain it, man. Some yeah. things you just know. Uh-huh. When I stepped out of the car, something about smelling the air, something about the entire area, I just was like, nah, this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> I just knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that Montana State was done in that moment, and we got an apartment within the week. Wow. Yeah, and so- I moved down uh, a couple months later. So then you go there, you, mm-hmm. you're in theater, you're like performing, doing all that stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> man, I got thrown into the deep end because I didn't understand. Like I showed up to my first audition wearing cargo shorts and a polo. Is that frowned upon? That's frowned that? upon, man. That's not how you show up to a general's audition. And anybody who's been in theater or listening to this podcast right now knows you don't go to your first college audition wearing shit you wear at a beach, you know? And so it's like, or hanging around on summer day. So, uh, I didn't get, I don't, I got, I didn't get cast in anything of the generals, uh-huh. which is what you do. You audition and they cast you in the main shows, the uh-huh. big shows. Um, but they accepted me into the, pro, into the BA program. I was going to do BFA, uh-huh. but they said I couldn't direct film. I couldn't direct theater. Wait, what do you mean? You can, you couldn't direct? Yeah. They wouldn't allow you to direct. Uh-huh. Once you do BFA acting, that's all you do is acting. Oh, okay. They don't yeah. let you go direct something else. Uh-huh. That's how they pitched it to me. And then I said, uh, then I don't want to apply for BA, BFA rather. I'd rather be a BA. So you want to do acting like for film or for, or do you didn't, did you want to do theater? I want to do theater uh-huh. and I wanted to direct theater. I wanted to produce theater. That uh-huh. was my, like, cause I'm okay. Cause I'm coming back 27 years, 27 years old, 26, 27 years old. Yeah. I'm not the kid who left at 19 uh-huh. from uh, uh, the other college. But is everyone else a kid? Like, yes. Everyone else is like, everyone else is seven years younger than me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, it's from, but I came back with a determination, with a desire to uh-huh. graduate, a desire to get my degree, a desire to learn to be an actor. Uh-huh. And so I spent, and, and so I, when I came back, it was like, you know, I was like focused yeah, yeah. and I was learning, I made mistakes. And I would learn quickly. Like uh-huh. I never showed up in a general's audition again with a cargo parents or a pair of shorts. <laughs> yeah. Like I focused, I learned a monologue cause I did a monologue out of a book and I held the book in my hand. Oh, you didn't know that. So you I didn't know, know I had to memorize to, yeah. it. Like I really didn't know anything, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, cause I had just done stuff at community college, like occasional plays at community college, but I didn't know what it was like to do like a legitimate thing. Uh-huh. And no one had told me yeah. I did cause I didn't know anybody. Yeah. I moved to Florida state, not knowing a fucking soul. 
So who's the first person you meet? Uh, my friend Rain's car, who lives yeah. in Alabama now. We became really good friends, and he kind of shepherded me through my first year there. Was he also in the program? Yeah, he was okay. also in the program. Yeah, yeah. But he, he was also older. Uh -huh. he, had, he had flunked out the first time around and came back oh, wow. at 25. Uh -huh. And so we kind of got along. And he was my shelter from everything else. We were like, I didn't become friends with a lot of people. Like, you know, and I had, you know, I had my thing and I was like, come out of the military. I was like suspicious, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to know, you know? And so like- Well, uh, you didn't want people to know you were in there? Yeah, I didn't, no, I didn't want people to know me. Like, I oh, just was like, yeah. I'm going to do my job and get, like, these are young people. Oh. Like, it was that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And, and so um, Brains and I were able to like, we would watch movies all the time because he also shared a love of movies. Mm -hmm. And he's got a massive toy collection, which he has a, uh, I think it's called Colonel Reigns online. And he has a massive toy collection, which you can buy stuff. Like what kind of toys? Like all kinds of toys, like Star Wars toys. Uh, like, you know, he's a collector. Uh -huh. So he has a massive storage huh. unit of this kind of stuff so so what was the plan you wanted to like uh like live the theater life or like did you want to go to like uh broadway or something no, you like well, be a broadway actor i didn't i didn't have that kind of pursuit necessarily it was more about learning to be an actor and uh -huh. could i be an actor oh, okay it was that simple uh -huh. can i do this because i love to do this am i good at this at this level so you never thought like in the future like no, five years later, no. like, what am I going to do? No, uh -huh. I, I just thought to myself, I want to be an actor, whatever uh -huh. that looks like. Uh -huh. Right. And so it was the greatest three or four years of my life. Like I had a great time at Florida state. And like we mentioned in, earlier in the podcast, I'm still friends with most of those people that I came in contact with at Florida state. Like we're all still friends. They all came here. Yeah. Most yeah. of them came here and we all kind of grew up together through the two thousands and now into the, almost the 2020s. You uh -huh. know? And so it's like, that's that was a, a phenomenal time. So so when did you decide to come to LA? In right, right after I graduated, I ran a production company for a little while and made some money. Uh -huh. And then at that point, I was like, okay, I directed a couple of plays and made some money. I was like, okay, I think I can do it because I had studied in London in '98 for three months, four months through through the Florida State program. Whoa. And so yeah. to me, I was like, my mind was expanding and getting bigger and bigger. And so the like, challenges to me seemed seem not as daunting as before. You're more confident. In yes, what, yeah. a lot more confident. And so it was between New York and LA. Uh -huh. And I'm a theater actor. Uh -huh. my, my, I'm big guy, big presence. So to me, it's like I'm a theater actor. But I I just didn't have the, like I just didn't think that was maybe the right choice in the end. And I had more friends going to LA and I just went with my friends, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, Michael Vogel, who's still one of my top, top friends. Like we we knew each other in London. We roomed together in London. So we became really good friends and we're still friends now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we, he was like, you know, come, come on, come on, come on. And my other friend, Michael Ross, had already gone ahead of us. And so he'd kind of like had a, a lay of the land, uh -huh. you know. And so, and I moved out there and I moved in with a friend who had been a, a teaching assistant. And he was around my age, Latino, Mexican guy as well, mm. uh, or Mexican heritage and into Shakespeare as much as I was um, and all that. Uh -huh. And so that's when I moved to LA. So what do you do when you get here? Like, uh, we, we move in together. Uh, um, I take headshots. I take black and white headshots, which is what you did back then. <laughs> oh, so um, you're hitting the ground running. Yeah, you're, you're trying to. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you take headshots. What do you do? Do you do, do you go on auditions like every day? Or yeah, what? not every day, but I would go on auditions. Um, I'd get an agent. I tried to get an agent. Uh -huh. uh, you know, because I'm Latino. I thought, well, there's a market that's not 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 a lot and exploited a lot. So it's like, okay, let me find out what this, what's available there. Uh, and in the meantime, I started working uh, as a temp. So I would do temp work and then do that and mm. do, uh, do plays. I was doing plays for the first seven years I was here in LA. Oh, you were just just a play? Uh -huh. You're a play actor? Yeah. Uh -huh. I just love theater, man. Uh -huh. I really do. I haven't acted in 10 years on, a, on stage, but uh -huh. it was like, I did that to kind of supplement my desire to create, mm. you know? And those... Those were great play. Those were fun experiences. But in the long run, my friend uh, Andre kept telling me he was like, Andre Gordon, he kept telling me, he's like, dude, you're not making any money doing these plays. <laughs> yeah, if this is LA. You're here to be an actor. Yeah. You got to be in movies and TV. So I had to kind of make a change in my life of more focusing on that as things went along. And I, and I, to be honest with you, Beardo, I wasn't ready for uh, LA as much as I thought I was. LA is, man, it, for all the sunshine and the, uh, you know, ladies in bikinis and these amazing things you can do, the city can kick your ass, man. It's and brutal. It, it, it's brutal. It yeah. can be. It's not as brutal as New York. New York, like, New York is like someone stepping on your throat every day. Yeah. 
LA is more like someone like holding you close and smothering you. And so, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, so to me, I had to figure that out as I was going along and, and I was not anywhere near in the mental capacity to handle LA as I thought I was. So, so then what were you, what did the, what was the change? You said after seven years, you want to do film and yeah. TV. Yeah. And also my dad got diagnosed with cancer. Wow. And so I kind of had to confront a lot of things about myself and I'm 35, 36 at the time. Uh-huh. And I was like, what have I been doing? Yeah. For the last five or six years. Like I would get occasional things, but it was nothing, anything big. You're like, where's my life going? Yeah. Where's my life going? Exactly. And by this point I'd moved in with Michael and my other friend Ian, we were living together and all this kind of jazz. And, and so it was like, I had to kind of, you know, make some changes, Yeah, you know? And so, uh, so where were the one, was one of the things you did like to make a change? Uh, I started to look at this more as a career Mm -hmm. and I started to open up the idea of spending, making, spending money to make money, spending money to Uh get into the situations, going to workshops, exploring those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like investing in yourself. Yeah, investing in myself. Exactly. Uh Being more focused about it, like reading books about it. Uh What's the success, you know, as I thought I was going to come out here and kick ass and no one and take names and. But you go on those first auditions, you, you it's your ass that gets kicked, yeah. you know? And and those are the moments that I started to regret not having a BFA because the BFA, most great BFA programs teach you how to handle the transition into LA or New York and how tough it can be because they set up showcases uh-huh. for you to audition in front of these people. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you had an audition like that before? No, I'd never mm. auditioned like that before. And it was uh, it was uh, quite a change because then they'd be like, do less, do less. I didn't know what that meant because I'm a theater actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? Do you always lie on the ground? Yeah. And why well, get the part like that? You know? And so it was a really strange experience for me coming here. And when you go to the auditions, is it just like a bunch of other Latino actors that are yeah. trying to get the same thing you were getting? Yeah, and you're most like, of the time. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you're like, I'm just another guy yeah. in, in a city of other guys right. trying to do the exact same thing right where yeah. i was king i was king of the walk at times at florida state because i was older uh-huh. they were able to put me into like give me some bfa roles uh-huh. because i was able to play these parts like i played a dad in lie of the mind mm. i played uh, uh uh claudius in hamlet i mm. played uh mr putnam in in um the crucible mm-hmm. so i was playing these older roles so i thought well oh, i've you- got some gravitas here so to speak so to <laughs> yeah, speak yeah. and i could walk into a, a, an audition and nail it and it, it, it was a, a, a very rude awakening do you, yeah. do you remember like the first uh part you got or first callback yeah you got? yeah first yeah. first part i got was uh thanks to my friend karen morris who was a casting associate for charmed mm-hmm. and she got me in the room she to, to audition? To audition. Yeah, yeah. She didn't get me the part. Yeah, She yeah. got me the room to audition. So then- uh, And I booked it. You booked it? Yeah. Without a callback or without anything? Without a callback, yeah. Oh, no, no. I had a callback, yeah. Uh-huh. But I booked it. And so, it was like a five-liner. part, five liner. Uh-huh. And some people have still tweeted me every once in a while that they just saw, just saw the outlaw and Charmed. And the TV show Charmed, that witch show? The, yeah, the yeah, witch show, yeah, 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 yeah. with Alyssa Milano and, uh-huh. and uh, all them. Yeah, I was on that. And I So did, is that one of your first times on set? Like, yeah, on first any, times on set, on any set, doing uh-huh. anything. Like, I, well, when I first came out here- uh-huh. I was lucky. I auditioned. There was like a uh, an ad for um, uh, to be an ex a military extra for this for the film Wind Talkers. Uh-huh. So when I first came in two thousand, that was there, and um, uh, my friend who was there with me, mm-hmm. uh, Edgar, he was like, "Hey, I just saw this in Backstage West. Do you want to audition?" It was literally two days after my father had left because my father had uh, we had driven across country. We, when we moved to when I moved to LA, my father and I drove cross country. It is the greatest trip I've ever taken with anyone ever. You like, guys were in the same car the whole time. the truck, at, <laughs> yeah. uh, a U-Haul truck. Yeah, yeah, from and Florida to LA to, to from from uh, Virginia oh, to you, LA. Oh, you went back to oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 because yeah. I had to pack all my stuff. Up. Oh, yeah. yeah, from Virginia to LA. So we drove the whole uh, all across, and it was the it was like the beginning of the fully repairing our relationship. We were able to have conversations and and talk and there was never any fights and Nothing. my dad told me so many things about his life that he'd never told me before that you never knew that of. i never knew yeah, of yeah, yeah. cuz i kind of reached that age where he could relate to me as a contemporary yeah, yeah and rather than just his son as a friend rather than just his son so then at that moment you're like you understand like oh this is why he did this you're right. and this is why he did this yeah. beginning the process of understanding it right uh-huh. exactly and so um we had a great time and mm-hmm. we broke down like four times what do you in mean that fucking truck? Oh. So yeah, it broke down on us four times. We got, we got our money back. Oh yeah. yeah. How long did it take? Like a week? Yeah, it yeah, took yeah. five days. Oh shit. 
Yeah, and we in Arizona we broke down with no cell reception. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know what we're gonna do here. So would you walk to like the nearest gas no, station? No, we kind of waited till the truck kind of cooled down, uh, and then we started up again, and it worked. Thank God, because mm-hmm. I mean, being stuck out in Arizona, yeah. and we were out in the mountains, son. Uh, and there wasn't no like vegetation; it was all <laughs> mountains, red clay. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I was worried we were gonna fucking die the coyotes or wolves and shit. Uh-huh. So yeah, but like we drove out here, and then when I came, when, when my, I put my dad on a plane, he left after we bought furniture and everything like that to to furnish my place with Edgar. And um, Edgar's like, "Hey, there's this audition on a Sunday. Do you want to go? It's for this film, Wind Talkers. It's a uh, John Woo's directing, but it's like you'd be a military extra, and you're still like kind of just a couple of years on the military. Do you want to go?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, fuck it, let's go, let's go." We almost didn't go. Like we had brunch. Uh-huh at like IHOP or Denny's or something. And then we were like, well, it's in the, it was in the Valley. And uh-huh. I was like, yeah, let's, let's go. So we went to the Valley and. But why wouldn't you go to that? I don't know. Cause I wasn't sure I wanted to book something right off the bat or audition with something. It's a All Sunday right. too. And do I want to be an extra? <laughs> oh yeah. You know, but we we're like, fuck it. Let's see what the experience is like. So yeah, we yeah. went and uh, Edgar got it and I got it, but I got as one of the core extras, one of 30 main extras, oh. which means I got Taft Hartley'd in from the beginning. So I've never worked a non-union day in my life. You were already SAG eligible from the I beginning. I was SAG eligible from the beginning, which uh-huh. never happens, right? No. It does yeah, not yeah. happen. But people were super pissed that I, <laughs> like my friends who had come out here ahead of me uh-huh. were super pissed yeah. that I had, it was, I was, I was SAG within three weeks of being here. <laughs> Like it's SAG eligible. Yeah, yeah. People because are still like 10 years in the business not being able, not being able to, <laughs> to be in SAG. Because back then you're searching for that third voucher. You yeah, got to yeah. get that third SAG voucher, you know? Oh, so it's not the third thing, the three vouchers thing anymore? I don't know. I thought it was. Maybe oh, it you is. don't know. You're SAG. Yeah, I don't know. I'm SAG. <laughs> <laughs> so like at the time, yeah. So I got it and I was very fortunate and I got to work with Nick Cage and Christian Slater and John Woo wow. and all these amazing people. Uh-huh. And it was such a great experience, you know, but it was terrible as well because what? you're, you know, doing, you're shooting at 1 a.m. and freezing cold. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're stuck on a bus with five other sick people when they can't put you out on set because it's so cold. And so you're getting sick because they're coughing in an enclosed area. And so it was all of that. But like, but I made some really good friends and I ended up being on a reality show afterwards with that because the, uh, um, the, the casting director, the technical or? advisor uh-huh. really liked me. Uh-huh. And so he brought me in to do two weeks of ADR work uh-huh. for the movie. Wow. That was my first experience with voiceover. Wait, you, so you had lines in the movie? Yeah. Wow. You can hear me in certain parts of the movie uh-huh. doing voiceover for certain people. Uh-huh. And you could see me in the movie. There's like five spots where you can clearly see me. I'm heavy as fuck. Because <laughs> I didn't know that like you when you did Crafty on a big feature film, like you could eat a buffet. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we were doing Tony's. Tony's catering service was doing our thing. We had yeah. lobsters for dinner. Steak, everything. Yeah, steak, it, it was it, nuts. Yeah, yeah. And they had Crafty. You could take as much food as you want off Crafty. So I'm shoving out candy bars and <laughs> granola bars, and I didn't think twice about it. <laughs> And I was thinking, no, I'm 250 fucking pounds. I'm like, Jesus Christ. You didn't think like, oh, I'm going to be on screen. Maybe I should slim down or something. (laughs) No, I'm like, I'm an extra. No one's going to fucking notice me. I'm just the guy in the background. Yeah, but then I am walking behind uh, Noah Emmerich or walking or running on the beach near uh, Christian, uh, near uh, Nicolas Cage and all these kinds of things. There are moments where you can see me in the film, but I am Mm -hmm. fucking massive. (laughs) And my hair is like this big hair and it's terrible, man. I look horrible in the movie. (laughs) So after that, you did a reality show? Yeah, I did yeah. a reality show called Combat Missions, which oh. if people remember, it was on USA Network, uh-huh. produced by Mark Burnett. Uh-huh. And the guy who had been the Navy guy in Survivor, the old guy, Rudy, he they mm. made him like the commandant of the camp and they brought people in from the military uh-huh. to like accomplish these tasks and these goals to get points to be the overall military winner of the show. Oh, okay. So, and, yeah. So you were just a contestant on the show? No, I wasn't a contestant. Oh. I was what they call the shadow squad, mm-hmm. which is they gave, the, we were the people they were fighting against. Oh, okay. So the TA, technical advisor from uh, uh, Wind Talkers, uh, Jim, he, he was like, do you want to come do this show? And so I went in with some, cause I had made friends on with some of the guys there and they suggested me and Jim was like, oh yeah, yeah, let's bring him on. And so we all kind of worked together for like four months on that show. What was that in Victorville? Oh, uh, way out there. Yeah. Way the fuck oh, out shit. there. On that old abandoned base. Oh shit. Yeah. But was that another thing that you were like kind of apprehensive about doing? Because it wasn't like a meaty role. It was just like a shadow guy. No, because they're paying us good money, man. Oh, it was good money. Yeah. yeah. And they're putting us up in the barracks and we had our own rooms. Mm. And mm. so it was great. Oh, okay. Yeah. So to me, I had a great time. And I could drive back to my apartment on the weekends if I needed to watch clothes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Come right back. And it, Victorville is like, you know, it's 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 is okay for what it is. Yeah. yeah. It's just nothing there. There's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was, this is before now there's like all kinds of stores there, but no, back then yeah, yeah. the big deal was they had a Best Buy and an Olive Garden. <laughs> 
So, yeah. so, so when you were SAG, did you join? You joined SAG right away. You had to join, or you? you I was chose SAG eligible, and then I joined after I finished Wind Talkers. Oh, okay. Because I had money. Because they were paying me like two hundred fifty a day, dude. On Wind Talkers. Yeah, Wind Talkers. Oh wow. Yeah. It, it, they they were paying you good money because uh, you get the higher end rate, and then you'd get money for overtime, uh-huh. and you get money for wearing makeup and hazard pay for being around the, uh, the explosions and the because you know, of war movie. The bumps. That yeah, you, the bumps. Yeah, the bumps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The bumps. Yeah, yeah. Which was always a weird negotiation thing. <laughs> And so, yeah, I did that for, uh, I did that for six months. So was that, was that like the most money you've ever made at that time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would so, say that. Sure. Yeah. So you're like, oh, this is easy. I can come yeah. to LA. So yeah. I pissed it all away. <laughs> I did. I pissed it all away on clothes and food and dates. Really? And yeah. Oh yeah. Man. You're just living I, large. Stupid. Yeah. Stupid. <laughs> you didn't like think- I said. Uh-huh. Yeah, like I said, I was not, I wasn't mature enough to handle LA. Like uh-huh. I just wasn't when I got here. And oh, I so that's what so you mean by it? Just like eat, spit you up, ate you and spit you out. Yeah, it really yeah. did because uh-huh. I didn't think, oh, I should invest this, I should save this, I uh-huh. should do something with this because it's not always going to be around. I just thought, oh, I can make this anytime I want. Yeah, and I just pissed it all away, man. So then, what do you do after you piss it away? Well, I did that reality show. Oh, yeah. I got a little more money and then pissed that all away. <laughs> and then I started temping and, and doing and auditions and stuff like that. And so, like I said, in 2007, dad got di- or 2006, dad got diagnosed. And, and like I made some, I started to look at some different things. And at the same time, I was going, I decided to go into therapy because mm-hmm. a friend of mine um, in 2005, she sat me down and she's like, listen, I, I, um, you're having a lot of fights with your friends. Because at the time, I was like, I was just really angry about everything, man, because yeah. I wasn't succeeding. I, was, uh-huh. I didn't have any money. Uh-huh. I was unhappy. Like I was just so unhappy. So I was starting to take stuff out of my friends. Yeah. That suspicious thing came back, uh-huh. you know? And so I thought my friends were, were excluding me from stuff or weren't, mm. weren't, didn't want me to be part of stuff. So I started to think that this was like, this was happening. And yeah, so, yeah. Kind of like a paranoia. Type? Yeah, paranoia. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. my friend sent me down and she's like, listen, I, th- I really need you to, um, I, I, I wanted to, I, we, I'd never fight with anybody mm-hmm. and I fought with you like three times. Uh-huh. And I, I need you to, I kind of go to therapy. And yeah. I'd never thought to go to therapy. Like it was something that was always in my culture seen as like, you know. For the crazy uh, people. Yeah, for the crazy people. Yeah, right? yeah. Not for, you know, anything that was like, you could be managed. And yeah. So, um, but it was, it was at a CPK and mm-hmm. we had lunch and she said that to me and, uh-huh. and, and, and I listened to her and my friend Edgar had been going and he suggests this place called the Maple Center. And I went there and it's where people are getting their hours before they become full-time therapists oh, okay. or psychiatrists. So yeah. yeah, it was like a, it was like a work in progress type thing for mm-hmm. them. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. So, but did, did, did that help you a lot or did Oh it, yeah. Yeah. It changed my life, dude. Uh-huh. Like it really did. The, the, doing the therapy, I was able to explore where all those feelings were coming from and they were from, which is ironic, it was coming from my dad because uh-huh. my dad had he was kind of ashamed at having a sensitive child. And, and, and it's not a matter of like, my dad was a bad person. It was, my dad didn't know how to raise a sensitive child. He yeah. wanted to have a macho child. He didn't have to worry about it because my dad himself was sensitive and he uh-huh. wasn't aware of it. Like he just didn't want to admit it. Oh. My dad was a vulnerable, sensitive guy uh-huh. and he was quick to anger, quick to get into fights with people verbally, not physically, verbally. Uh-huh. And on the, like, I remember many times he would argue with people on the phone, like so loud. Really? Like, it was, yeah, it was not an, it was not always the best, happiest house. You know, and so he didn't want you to be like him. He, yeah, he, uh, he he didn't want me to be like. So he thought if you're strong, you can handle the world. You'll be tough. Mm. But that made me ashamed of my sensitive nature, which is of course what is the best part of my acting. And yeah. so I had this internal civil war for a long time that I wasn't aware of. Um, and it wasn't until it all came to a head with my friend sitting me down, going, "You need to go and talk to the therapist." And so I went, and I was very lucky to get this therapist, Valerie. Um, who interviewed me. And then I said, can I choose you? And she's like, yeah, you can go with me if you want. I was Uh like, great. I'd like to go with you. And that began like three years of therapy. And it was really, really powerful. And she got me to look at things Mm -hmm. and she got me to realize that it was coming from my dad. Like it was from my dad Mm -hmm. and how he had, um, whenever he had made fun of how sensitive I was or had made me ashamed of it by making, by just kind of like saying, stop crying or stop doing this. Why are you so, what, what do you care? Like oh. it would just be like something that would be irritating to him. Oh, he would make fun of you for yes. being sensitive. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. He thought he was doing it to uh-huh. toughen me up. Yeah. But what it did was really hurt my, because I'm a sensitive kid, it hurt yeah. my heart. Uh-huh. Where as opposed to me reacting, yeah, you're right, dad, fuck him. You're right. Mm. I went like, fuck, he really hates me. Yeah. My father's ashamed of me. Oh. And so I was ashamed of myself. But that's what like a Latino parent says. It's like tough love. They, yeah. think, they think tough love will work. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're different now as a culture, but certainly was very, very prevalent back then. You uh-huh. know? And so, um, 
Yeah. So like that, my, when we did the therapy, we explored that and we, and it took about a year and a half to get to what it was. Oh, you, you went through it for a year and a half? I went through it for three years. Oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. 2005, 2008. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so was like- Was it like a day, uh, a weekly thing or like- <laughs> It was a day. We were dating. Day, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. It was a weekly thing. Uh -huh. Every week uh, I would go and it was like, and with there you, they look at your income and they uh -huh. prorate it. Oh, so, so I, I was paying 20 bucks a session. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, which was amazing. Oh, you because people think therapy is like $1,000 a session. It or can something. be. Uh -huh. It can be. It depends on who you go to. But because it's that through a funded place like a Maple Center, uh -huh. you get lower rates because they're also not fully licensed therapists. They're getting their hours to be officially oh. therapists. So you kind of, it's kind of a deal you're making. Uh -huh. Were you, I, I got a good one. She uh -huh. was great. Were you acting out at that time? Were you like drinking or like doing like dangerous things or, for your life or in your <sighs> life? Damn, that's a good question. Because I wonder if you were just like, starved for attention where like you wanted to put yourself in danger just to get someone to say hey just to get someone to like sit no, you down and say hey no like, i would storm out of rooms oh, okay. i would have strong reactions uh -huh. i wouldn't i wasn't drinking or no 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 like i didn't just i didn't yeah i wasn't i, I drank a lot in the military and uh -huh. then i stopped doing that uh -huh. um but yeah no i wasn't doing anything i was more like picking fights with my friends uh to, for, for no real for no reason, reason yeah, just yeah. to just to take the just to cap off the steam, just to let out the steam. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so I, it would, it would, I would see things that weren't there. Uh -huh. And so I would get into it and blah, blah, blah. And so it was happening in my friendships uh -huh. uh, and in my relationships too. Right. Right. At, the at that time, but I didn't really see it in my relationships. I thought it was my friendships more than anything else. Uh -huh. And so when we went through the therapy, that's when we discovered like it had been for my dad. And, and that's when I realized that the reason I hadn't connected with my friends as powerfully, as strongly as I had before is because I was afraid mm -hmm. and I was ashamed of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think I had worth in comparison to them because they were accomplishing things. They were moving up in the chains of their uh -huh. respective companies and doing all these things. They were saving money. They were able to invest in Broadway shows. Wow. Like they were doing all these things that I wouldn't, couldn't even conceive of. Uh -huh. And I felt like such a loser next to them that I didn't think I had value. Mm -hmm. So I would go to these parties and I would just be completely any social because I didn't think anybody wanted to talk to me mm -hmm. and it was terrible. But what I realized was, and through the therapy was that I have to take the chance to be vulnerable. Yeah. The vulnerability is what I was ashamed of, mm -hmm. yet the vulnerability is where my true strength was. And that's where you're afraid of being vulnerable yes. to, to, for somebody else. Right. Or, because yeah. I was told being vulnerable is being a pussy, is uh -huh. being uh, weak. Uh -huh. Right. And so my therapy got me to see that being vulnerable is actually strength. Be so, able to talk about your feelings and convey, and convey your feelings. So I was able to tell my friends, uh -huh. even my friends who were like kind of outside of my realm of my really big, like, here's what's been happening for me. And I want to tell you this. Uh -huh. And maybe we won't be any closer friends, but I feel like I need to tell you. So I would oh, allow my, take the chance to open up and let myself yeah. get hurt. But in exchange, my relationships deepened so powerfully. And it was one of the greatest things ever. Like all my drama stopped, all mm. the fights with my friends, everything stopped. And people were like amaised at the changes within me. Yeah. And relationships with women, did that like help out? Or yeah, for the most out? part, yeah. it did. It did. And, and, um, I was able to like, you know, kind of come to terms with stuff, but also like when my, but then also having to confront my dad, like that was the really hard, hard part of it all. And, um, you know, but my, to my dad's credit, he was able to like, cause by this point, my dad had diabetes for 10 years. And so he was already softening up. Uh -huh. And then when the cancer came, he really had to face his mortality. Uh -huh. And so we would have these amazing discussions about life. Like dad was finally able to open up and mm. talk about his world and talk about his life, his feelings. And, and I was kind of the only one he could do that with. Cause my brother just didn't want to hear anything negative and just wanted him to focus on staying alive. Mm -hmm. And my sister was also kind of worried about my dad talking too much about the stuff because it would make him sad but so and 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 man to man like we were yeah. just able to have conversations because i had been through the wars of my life uh -huh. and so we were able to just kind of like have conversations as friends and that's when then when the therapy like when the therapy was happening he was initially like hesitant to me going and of course but they pulled out the old school stuff about being you're not crazy and i was like yeah. well no i'm not but i need to figure this out and then we were able to start having these conversations about what had happened between us. Mm -hmm. And to my dad's credit, he was open to having these conversations. And um, yeah, it was amazing. That, that, that helps so much just to mm -hmm. talk, talk things out and just like communicate, verbalize everything that's mm -hmm. going on in your head. Yeah. Like it just opens up so much. Yeah. And at the time I had this amazing girlfriend who was mm -hmm. really, uh, really supportive and, and amazing with me and, and uh, um, just walking me through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And my, my dad passed, you know, and in 2008, and, uh, was it a, was it like a, what kind of cancer was it? It was mesothelioma, which oh, is okay. an asbestos cancer, uh -huh. which stays dormant in your body for like 20 years. 
And then it just and like, then it shows up and wipes you out. What, so was it like a fast thing that it took he, two years? Okay, but it's a zero percent survival rate. Nobody oh. survives. Wow. Once you get diagnosed, you're basically on a time clock. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's when he's like, okay, I'm leaving. Yeah. Like he he's going to be gone, and that's when he's like, okay, now I have to make up with my son. Well, I, have- I don't know if he was. I have to make up with my son. I think it was more like he was more open to the idea of having the conversations mm-hmm. that he would might not have been as open about before. Uh huh. And so when we. I remember we, we, I would come home and we would have these like just great times. And it would, it would take the pressure off my mom and my sister because they would take care of my dad all the time. Because mm-hmm. one of the things they did was they removed my dad's right lung wow. and replaced it with a bag. Uh-huh. And he had this like um, seven or eight inch gash on the side of his chest that they had uh-huh. to put gauze in every night and uh-huh. every morning. Uh-huh. So it was constant care for my dad to keep him alive. So your mom was doing that for my him? My mom and my dad. And my oh. mom and my sister. Wow. And my sister had been an EMT, had been an EMT and my mom had been a nurse, right? Oh, yeah, as yeah. we had mentioned earlier. Uh-huh. And so they knew how to take care of my dad, you know, with that. But what I came in was offered emotional support and conversations. And, you know, my dad would talk about how tough it was uh-huh. with the cancer and how he had, like, he was like, there were moments where he was like, I should just, what if, what, do you think it'd be negative if I just, you know, ended it? And mm-hmm. I was always like, well, dad, this is your last battle. Like, yeah. you have to leave a legacy for your children. Like, if you if you can survive this to the end, like, died with dignity and yeah. logically, like, as you should die, I think it's, I think it's like, you, you, will, uh, you will ascend to the right hand of God. You will have, you know, we will be where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I think if you kill yourself this close to yeah. the end, uh, it could call, you know, like depending on faith, right? Yeah, His faith. like a mortal sin. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. His faith. And so um, we were able to have these amazing, powerful conversations and, and also relaxing conversations, fun conversations. I mean, we laughed like we never had before. And we, I just, that's a, that's a time I cherish my, when I miss my dad and I miss my dad a lot. Uh-huh. Those are the moments that I miss the most because we were all the bullshit was stripped away and yeah. we were just friends, man. Yeah. We're not father, son. There's friends. no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. We could sit and watch football together. We should sit and watch TV together. He loved watching the people's court and judge. He loved those judges' shows. He <laughs> yeah. loved those shows. My parents loved those shows too. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People and uh, he loved Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. So we would sit and watch shows all day. Uh huh. And just because he couldn't go anywhere, we were just sitting talking all day and talk about life and talk about things and it was so great. And, um, were you living back home at that time? No, no. I would come to LA. I would fly back and forth. Oh, okay. Because yeah, my dad didn't want me. He's like, you keep pursuing your dreams. I don't want you to stop pursuing your dreams to come take care of me. Your sister's here. Your brother's uh-huh. here. Your mom's here. But you didn't want to stay with him and say, hey, like, I only got like six months left. Like, I want to be, I want to spend as much time as I can Yeah, with I you. tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my dad was like, no. Yeah. Everyone is here. Uh-huh. But when my dad knew he was going to die, he reached out to me in January of 2008 and he said, you got to come home. Uh-huh. And he's never done that. He yeah. had never done that before. He never said, come home. No, he never said like, you got to come home. Yeah, he'd yeah. always be like, well, if, if you have some time, come home for a couple of weeks, blah, blah, blah. But this time he was like, Johnny, I think I'm close. So uh-huh. you got to come home. And man, and I flew back and I was supposed to do the SAG awards and they were real gracious to like take my, like, to, to take my job someplace. And I flew in and, um, and I spent two and a half weeks, three weeks with him. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, it was really powerful, man. Yeah. And uh, I had this one night where we, came to terms about everything. Mm -hmm. And we were just eating Chinese food, which we'd always gotten from this place, Sampan in Woodbridge. And my mom's at the table and my dad and I are on opposite sides of the table. And we're just eating, talking. And we start talking about soccer. And that was baseball for American fathers. Soccer is that way for me and my dad. Yeah, yeah. Soccer, football, you know, we would talk about, like for years, my dad and I would have Sunday conversations about soccer. Like it just was great. And we started talking about it. And all of a sudden, man, I just started crying, like just waves. Like what Tom Hanks does in Private Ryan, where it's like he's cough crying, he can't stop himself. It's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. That's what was happening for me. After Rabisi dies, he has that moment where he's by himself and he's like, he's like shoving his fist in his mouth because he can't stop himself from crying. Uh-huh. That's how powerful it just was waves and waves of shit, of just all this like stuff that had been pent up for years of mm-hmm. pain, you know. And then I was losing my dad. I was my dad was dying. You yeah. Know? It finally hit me. Uh-huh that I wouldn't be able to talk soccer with him anymore. Like it just fucking hit me like a ton of bricks. And did you ever see him crying? No, but what he did was this, he reached over and he held my hand. My dad had never uh-huh. done that. Like he'd always made me ashamed that I could cry easily. He'd yeah. always made me ashamed of it. Like or, men don't cry. Yeah. Men yeah. don't cry. That yeah. kind of thing. But this time he let me just, and he just held my hand as I cried. And I, that meant so much to me. And you know, he said to me, he was like, I want to say something to you. And I, I want you to know that I'm sorry for every mistake I ever made in raising you. I loved you. You're my son. You're my firstborn. You mean everything to me. Wow. And I'm sorry that 
I'm sorry, I, I didn't do a better job, you know? And it was so powerful for me because it was finally like him saying that he was proud of me and that he loved me. And, and I thought I had let him down so many times because of my own internal struggles with how to live my life, with how to live, the, how to be, you know, how to fight against this internal civil war. I thought I had embarrassed him and ashamed him. And he just, he gave me, he said to me, he said, and I said, you know, I said, dad, I'm sorry too. I'm sorry for any time I hurt you, said anything wrong, you know, mouthed off to you, did like embarrass you in any way or hurt you. Like, I, I'm sorry too. And he was like, no, no, it's okay. I don't want you to, I just want you to know I love you. I've always loved you. I know it wasn't always easy between us and I'm sorry for my part in it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we could have gotten there if I hadn't done the therapy. And I don't think we could have gotten there if I hadn't had these conversations with him while I was doing the therapy, yeah. where we were opening the door up slowly. And he was, he was okay opening it and vulnerable because he, he believed, he trusted that he, I wasn't going to blame him. Yeah. Like, and that's the thing I learned in therapy was that with my dad, like you had to understand why he couldn't be the kind of father that would have been successful with a sensitive kid mm -hmm. because of his upbringing, because of the struggles, because of the abuse, because of all these things that colored how he parented. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for him to parent me correctly. But at, but at that time he was saying, at least I tried. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he was saying, I tried. I did the best I could uh -huh. with what I had. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know before I leave, I've always loved you. You've mm -hmm. always been my favorite because you were first born. Mm -hmm. And you've always been like, you just want you to know, like, I loved you and mm -hmm. I loved you more than, you know, anything. And I was, I am proud of you. I'm proud of the man you've become. And because, you know, the therapy was changing me too. I was more settled. I was more like able to have these kind of conversations and I, I was able to love myself, man. And yeah. that was really powerful, man. And so, um, the therapy really helped with that. And so and, everything yeah. just connected. It was yeah. just like the perfect time. It really just did. Like it, now we can settle everything. That's and we did. Going to, yeah. And we had a great time. I remember we watched the Giants Patriots Super Bowl, the first Giants Patriots Super Bowl yeah. together, which uh -huh. was really great. And, um, and then, um, he put me on a plane, <laughs> son <laughs> of a bitch. Wait, what do you he, mean? He knew he was going to fucking die. Uh -huh. And after we had that conversation and we'd come to, he said, I think you you should go back to LA and blah blah blah. And I'm like, but that he was in hospice at this time. Which you don't I, wanna, did, uh, I didn't understand what hospice was fully. Is that at home? Or, yeah, at uh, home. Uh -huh. So he's basically waiting to die. Uh -huh. And so he's like, you got to. You've been here three weeks. I don't want you sitting around here waiting for me to die. I want uh -huh. you to go back, keep living your life, blah blah blah. And I was like, okay, okay, but I'll come back in a couple of months or three months. But he's like, yeah, of course, of course. Gave me this. He pulled me into the bedroom. He gave me this goodbye message, and it was it was so strong because he just was like. You know, he just said, don't quit. He just said, don't quit. It's going to get tough. I'm not going to be there for you. Fight. He just said that, oh, fight. You deserve it. Fight. You know, and it was so powerful to have him say that. You know, my dad's all weak and frail at this time. And it just was so bad. And I hugged him. Like, I held him like I was holding a piece of, of crystal or porcelain. Like, I didn't want to drop him. And I just held him and... You know, and he's and I said I'll be back, and you know he fucking knew because he just goes, okay, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. He just did that because he knew he was gonna die, and he just was telling me like, sure, 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 you come back, sure, sure, yeah. no problem. And so you know, I, I got on the plane, I went back, and and um, I called like three days later to talk to him, and I my mom picked up and we talked, and um, he's like, uh, I tell him I can't come to the phone, and my mom was he can't come. He says his throat's clogged up and mm. but we can't talk him you know because at the time the fluid was really bad with my dad and he's like oh, I said, oh you can't talk i was like okay well tell him i'll call him on friday blah 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 and, or you know he's, he's like okay okay he died that he died that night because <laughs> he knew he, yeah he he sent me back because he knew i wasn't going to be able to handle him dying in front of me you wouldn't like you oh, wouldn't God. be able to see that no no that your father that's, that's, my the, that's the guy who raised you that's that's your life we had been through the wars with each other and outside of each other and had come back and had discovered our love for each other's powerful love for each other mm -hmm. and when when he sent me on the plane he knew what he was doing and he comes to the phone he knew what he was doing he wanted our interaction our last interaction to be the speech he gave me to the give me the, the counsel and the speech he gave me and the hug we had and when he died that morning, like my, I remember my sister called, my sister had to call me like 15 times to wake me up. Mm -hmm. And 
I got the phone call and I just was like, so kind of out of it. And she kept saying, the, he signed a DNR. And I, what does that mean? Yeah. And she says, DNR. And I was like, what does that mean? And she goes, do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate. And I was like, oh. Huh. So I said, he, is he dead? She's like, he's gone. And you know, I cried. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you, what's the, yeah, what do you do at that time? I, at the time I was, I was seeing this girl and huh. I, I said, will you take me to the airport? Um, uh, cause my dad passed and blah, blah, blah. And her mom had, her mom had passed from cancer early, like a year ago, wow. a year before this. So she understood. Right. Um, I was seeing someone else at the time. This is an ex-girlfriend of mine mm -hmm. who picked me up and took me to the airport, but she lived right down the street from me. And she said, if you ever need me for anything, mm -hmm. because she knew what I was going through, uh -huh. I will be here for you. Um, and so, um, she picked me up, took me over like four in the morning. Hmm. And, but I, before, as I was waiting for her to pick me up, this is no lie. This is why I believe in God and angels and heaven and stuff. I was sitting in the uh, living room on my futon television on just absentmindedly after I packed. And then, and this is no lie out of nowhere, out of nowhere, the room kind of got a little darker. And then I saw this light in the corner. Mm -hmm. And I will swear on everything I am that that was my dad coming to say goodbye to me with his spirit. And I immediately put my hand out and I felt him hold my hand. And then I felt him let go and then the room got brighter. It, and wow. it was not like, it wasn't like it was all dark. It was just, it got a significant, just a little bit less. Just dark. noticeably. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. noticeably uh, darker and then noticeably lighter. I forever I will believe that that was my dad coming to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. You can, you can feel his presence in, uh -huh. the, in there. Yeah, because we had yeah. made a deal. Uh -huh. We'd made a deal before. Like I said, I said if you, if there is an afterlife, if there is God in heaven, you got to find a way to let me know. Yeah. You got to find a way to let me know. <laughs> and he did, and he kind of did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was like in that moment, I was really like just I felt peace, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, my friend picked me up to where I flew in. Um. And then that, that like when I arrived, they took me right to the morgue and um, I insisted, I wanted to see my dad. And they drove me down there and, and my sister and my mom picked me up and, they, and I went in there and they, we walked all the way down. And did my you, sister had connections because she'd been an EMT. She had uh, connections to get us in there. And did you go alone or did you go? No, I go with them. I went with them. Uh -huh. And um, as soon as I turned the corner, I saw my dad in, in on the gurney mm -hmm. behind the glass because they, you know, I, I just lost it, man. Yeah, I lost it in a way I've never lost it before. Did you get angry, or did you just like? No, know? I just was destroyed. I just was depressed. I would relate it to like the Bible, where they tear their clothes. I felt like tearing all my clothes and uh -huh. just falling to pieces. And I just just seeing this man who was so full of life, who was so. He enjoyed the world in his way, you know, and he was, yeah, yeah, he had anger. Yeah, he had stuff, but he was also very happy when he loved stuff. My dad's laugh was, one of, I'm making my dad laugh was one of my favorite things in the world. And so, you know, to see this body now without life in it just destroyed me. And it was my father and I was, I was banging against the wall. My sister immediately just spontaneously started just burst into tears. My mom burst into tears. The nurse burst into tears because she had never seen this level of pain uh -huh. or so she said. And and I said to her, I said, you got to let me touch him. And she's like, well, that's not, I said, you got to let me in the room. I don't care what you got to do. I'm going to shatter the glass myself, but you got to let me in. And she let me in and I, and, I, and I walked over to his body and I got, the best way I can describe it is it felt like primal mm -hmm. where I went up to his body and I almost became like a, like a, an, a gorilla or an, a monkey or a chimpanzee. Like I took his hand and I was putting it on the back of my head. Like, I just, I didn't want to believe he was gone. Oh, just like, yeah, just, I, just, I, just, I, to that, see something. Yes. See, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, I regressed all the way back to some kind of beast. Uh -huh. And the only thing I could communicate was primal with the touching of his hand on the back of my head. Like I've seen, I've seen done, you know, and it was so weird. And then I just collapsed on the ground and cried for like five, 10 minutes, just collapsed next to his body, uh, you know, in the, and I could feel the cold of the morgue and I just was there. And that was, you know, that was um, the experience of it all, you know? And then I, I got myself together, I said goodbye to his body and walked out and 
you know, of course we had the wake and then the funeral and my friend, my girlfriend, my friend flew my girlfriend in mm. on her dime wow. to be with me for a few days after the funeral. And, you know, my friends, my friends all came, which were amazing. They all came and my dad's workers came to me. It was like the, it's a wonderful life moment. Mm. My dad was so afraid that no one would show up to his, you know, and, I mean, and it's, you, Sorry. Oh, sorry, no, but he he wanted you wanted to see like all these people celebrating his life. Yes, yeah, yeah, and I was unsure who was going to show up, and uh-huh. the room was full, uh-huh. and I couldn't believe it because my dad was so afraid that. And and this is why Memories of Me is a film that I absolutely love. The Billy Crystal Alan King movie with Joe Beth Williams. If you guys have never seen this movie, near the at the end, he you know the things happen and people show up, and mm-hmm. he. He's the whole time he's saying he's, no one's going to show up, no one's going to show up, and people show up. And yeah. so when, when my father died, like all these people showing up from work for who had worked with him like decades before, showing up, and because at this time he had become a, a hotel, he worked for the hotels as a head banquet waiter. He'd been around a number of hotels to pay for us, and um, I was so surprised. Like mm-hmm. the whole family showed up from both sides. My, oh my, a lot of my friends, my sister's friends, my brother's friends, the ones that he had, and and. Um, all my dad's coworkers that had been with them, like most of them mm-hmm. showed up and it was like, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. That's know? a great, that means like he made an impression yes, on them. Like yes. Big enough for them to show up. To exactly. Take, yeah. Exactly. And the one thing that my dad said to me before he passed, you know, he said, he's like, I know I'm leaving you in good hands mm-hmm. because you have these amazing friends that I didn't have growing up. I didn't uh, have these friends. He, you know? he never thought he had friends he, or well, anybody. He only thought he had a few friends. Uh-huh. Right. But he, he didn't, he never had really close friends. My mm-hmm. dad had only a couple of friends and, but growing up through college and, you know, those, those, those things like that, my dad in the twenties, like he didn't have, mm. you know, those friends in his twenties and thirties, he didn't have the friends that I have. And so he's like, so when all those friends showed up for my dad, I was like, you had more than you thought. Like yeah, I, yeah. I had this moment where I, him, I was like, yeah, no more than you thought. So, so, so do you take that and say, Hey, I'm going to be a good person because I want people to show up for me as well. I'm going to be a better person. Well, not necessarily that impetus to have people show up. And it's more a matter of, um, just, making him proud, Mm -hmm. you know, and keeping him in my heart. I mean, he's up there, uh, right there. He's, that's my dad and I in front of 12 angry men where we, where I directed that play. He drove down from, from Virginia to watch me do that play. And and so there's, there's all, that's, there's three or four things up there of my dad that I keep and Mm -hmm. I just keep them as up there here in my living room to Mm -hmm. always remind me of him. I wear the ring on the Schmodown for the big matches because I want my dad with me in the big matches, you know? And so, those things mean something to me. And um, I think that's the greatest thing where he just says, mm-hmm. uh, like, I believe in you, like, go fight, like, fight it, yeah. like, fight the big fight, yeah. like, stick with it. Yeah. Don't, and I'm, I'm not there up. yet, but, uh-huh. but I'm always fighting, man. And yeah. I'm always pushing and I'm always hustling. And real life is real life, man. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a struggle. And, um, but a, a little bit after that, I, I, I was working, I left the job, I left all my jobs mm-hmm. uh, in 2010. I left everything I was doing and I took a little bit of money. And uh, I reinvested in myself. And mm-hmm. for five years, I was able to make a living as an actor, uh, huh. booking voiceover work, booking commercials, booking on camera theatrical. I was able to make a living for five years and occasionally unemployment. I was able to make a living in five years doing doing mm-hmm. what I wanted to do with my life. And it was such a way to be like, to give that back to my dad. Like, yeah, yeah I can do it. Yeah. You know, and so like, I'm sticking with it. Yeah, I'm sticking yeah, with yeah. it. Right. Exactly. So after, and it took three years to get over his passing, like really get over his passing. Cause yeah. you go through, it's true what they say. You go, and anybody listening who's lost someone recently or lost a parent and before, you know what I'm talking about. And this is a club that only certain people, like you all, when you lose a parent, you enter this club and you all get it. Mm-hmm. Nobody who is outside the club gets it, really gets it. And like you, what this, you, you go through this period of loss uh-huh. and then anger. Uh-huh. And then acceptance, mm-hmm. right? And so for me, it took three years. And I remember it was a Father's Day. I was driving back from a camping trip and the sun was coming up over the mountains. And for the first time ever, I didn't feel sad that of, about the time that I lost with my dad. I felt appreciative of the time that I did have. Yeah. And that changed. That's when everything changed for me. And I started to like become at peace with the loss of my dad. It's just a different way of looking at yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And that just, that it took just about three you. years. Yeah. And it's all progression, man. It's all like a progress. And you got to go through your, you got through, through your, however you're built emotionally, you got to go through your process, man. I mean, you you can't really like fully get over it. Like it's, it's no. going to be like with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's always a hole in my heart. Uh-huh. And, and whenever I see something that's dad related, yeah. like I Guardians of the Galaxy 2, man. Uh, right, right near. I, 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 I haven't yeah, seen you it. You haven't so seen it. Well, there's, yeah. there's a moment, and it really just it came for me, and I was like, damn it. Yeah, 
<laughs> it just Damn it. kills you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it really does. That's why Up is such a t- Up. Uh, yeah. Oh man, the opening of Up. I went to see that right after he had, like a little bit after my dad had died, and uh-huh. a couple of my other friends had had their parents die over the last few years before that too. Uh-huh. And you could, there was like all of us bawling in the first row of the El Capitan <laughs> because we were remembering what that experience was uh, like. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it's really powerful. Um. I've been keeping you here long enough. Oh yeah. I'm um, oh, sorry. Where no, were we? No, 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 but just off topic. Yeah. Random question. Yes. When you did, when you, <laughs> were you looking at the time or something? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Sorry. Am um, I breaking the record yet? No, no, not yet. <laughs> um, when you take theater classes, do, do you work on your voice? Uh, when I take theater classes, do I work on my voice? Like, you, like, are you, is there like classes to like get, build your voice? Because yes, you have like a great voice. Well, I, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, people have told me that all my life uh-huh. and I did, I did the announcements in high school. Uh-huh. And so, and I DJed it my first, first trip through college. And, um, no, I mean, I just have always had this voice. I've always just had natural mm. of this voice and I don't get tired. I can talk for like we, uh, Mark Ellis and I did that 40 hour live stream last year with uh, Nost mm. and I talked four days straight. Didn't get a, didn't get uh, wow. sore or anything or, Your voice or doesn't leave or anything. No, it no. doesn't. It wow. doesn't. Unless I yell, uh, yeah, yeah. my voice doesn't go. Yeah. And so um, I just can talk. <laughs> that's basically what I tell you. And yeah. So that's why I'm kind of exploring Outlaw Nation podcast. It's kind of a, a kind of a, a a run at possibly having my own show yeah, yeah. on somewhere where I get paid to talk about stuff for three hours, like what you see on 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 radio or whatever or yeah, Sirius yeah. XM. You know, yeah. and so, so you would like to have your own uh, Sirius yeah. XM show? Oh, like, I absolutely do. I oh, absolutely yeah. want my own show. Yeah, I yeah. think I'd be great at it, uh-huh. and I think I'd get great guests, and I think I'd have fantastic conversations and fun stuff to talk about. I, that's kind of become my new goal. Would it be just you or would it be like you and a group of people? Or oh, I think it would be me. And then maybe like what's the Howard Stern has with Robin Quivers or yeah, something yeah. like, I'd like to have a female voice yeah. in, the, in the room to be either a co-host or to be someone who's like, like letting me be the a-hole and then who comes in and like, you know, uh, you educate. like Emma, yeah. like Emma and I would have an awesome radio show, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, and we'd have a great, cause she has a great voice too. And uh-huh. for doing what she does and it'd be interesting. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the goal now and doing all the stuff that I'm hosting shows and all this, it's, it's kind of leading me to where it's going to go and I'm leading, I'm staying open to all possibilities. You know? So is so, that the main goal or are you still working on, on acting or what? Well, voiceover acting, yes. Uh-huh. Not so much theatrical or on camera. No. I really don't care that much about it anymore. You don't uh, want your face to be seen or anything? Nah, you want to be famous? I don't, no. Nah, I don't have the ego for that anymore. <laughs> I really don't. No. Like, it's, it's cool. I'm, I'd be quite happy being a successful voiceover artist yeah. and no one ever seeing my face. Yeah. Like I don't have the ego about that anymore. Like mm-hmm. when I first got here that was all about that you yeah know? and now i'm just like if i book something great if i don't book it great you know i'm working at universal studios i got enough to pay my bills i'm trying to build this establish myself there's stuff i'm working on myself personally to kind of become a better partner overall for my future wife and mm-hmm. so those are the things that i'm focusing on and mm-hmm. so me being worried about some ego need to be in front of the camera or whatever it's not my jam no, no i'm not putting like other people want to do that i'm not saying yeah. it's from an ego place for them mm-hmm. that's what it feels like for me mm-hmm. and so i wouldn't want it i don't want to do that anymore like yeah. my goal is my voice is clearly what is really good about me and uh-huh. and what is what i'm best at yeah. and so um that's so you, kind of the situation yeah. you're reinvesting in yourself again yeah 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 in a different way so, yeah and, and christian's been great to do that for me and to oh, help yeah. me out through this whole yeah. process he's helping everybody out it's awesome yeah. like, he's the man <laughs> Everyone I've come in contact with yeah. mentions him at least five times. He's because- a rising tide lifting all the boats. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me oh, at your place. Yeah. Or, yeah. Thanks, Beardo. No, no, yeah. it was my pleasure. I hope, but I hope I didn't talk your ear off about stupid shit. No, no, Were we no, all this right? Was great. Yeah. yeah? Are I you mean, sure? I had a good time. Did you yeah. have a good time? I had a great time. Yeah. Did we not have enough laughs? Did we have laughs or not? Uh, I had a couple. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to depress people. <laughs> no, no, no. Should we talk about something random really quick or no? You have um, to go. No, I don't have to go. What do you, what do you, you have like, should we talk mind? about anything that's funny? Um, no. Nah. Because I don't want people to be left with a, like a like sad a story about my dad dying. But, I, but I think like just the reaction that they get is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you have something you want to bring up. The Schmodown, wanna... man. The Schmodown. Oh, what, what do you want to talk about the Schmodown? Uh, do you have the belt or no? No, I don't have <laughs> the belt. Riley has the goddamn belt. <laughs> Riley. Uh, well, do you remember the question that you lost on? Yes. Judy Greer. Oh yeah. yeah. Marvel Ant- movie. Ant-Man. <laughs> Ant-Man. Son yeah. of a bitch. <laughs> If that had just come on on one of the pay channels, I'd have fucking remembered that name. You don't That's, watch Marvel movie, Marvel movies? Not all the time. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. No, but what, what's your what's your? Oh, you you like westerns? I love westerns. I, I couldn't. When you chose that category, I knew none of those questions. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that's great man yeah. but I think I made a mistake I should have gone classics with Riley just to uh-huh. see what would happen oh uh, yeah because with scores and soundtracks what I stupidly did was eliminate my possibility to steal it I did oh, steal yeah. a point yeah yeah but 
like I eliminated my possibility of possibly stealing two pointers or four pointers and getting yeah. way, way ahead. And he also knew a little bit about scores and sound. He knows a lot about scores and sound, which I didn't know. And uh, I should have scouted him. See, the thing uh, is I, I, I got overconfident because I'd beaten him twice before. Uh-huh. I thought I can handle it. Yeah. And I almost did. Like he, like Jack, he almost didn't get Jack Black. Uh-huh. If he hadn't gotten Jack Black, he would have once again lost in a five pointer where he could have won. Jack Black was the, was the category? It, no, Jack Black was the answer. For, for it was for it was five point question was uh-huh. like what actor uh was in what king kong actor also provided voices in the films of shark, shark tale and uh-huh. something else that one's easy like well yeah, yeah uh-huh. but uh-huh. in his mind but he has to ask the question to be repeated again because oh, he uh-huh. didn't he had to get his mind around it oh he was probably thinking like naomi watts or Andrew, Adrian yeah, Adrian brody, brody. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah okay yeah because yeah, i've never or even seen jamie shark bell tale. who was well, in that he was in king uh, kong uh yeah. Oh, he's the, the young blonde yeah, guy? He's young, yeah, the young uh, guy on the ship. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So mm. There's a number of people he could have chosen. Yeah. Which, yeah. which, so your thing is Westerns? Yeah, what's I you, love what's Westerns. Your, what's your like weakest category? <laughs> Scores and soundtracks. <laughs> yeah, I, wouldn't, I, was, I wouldn't know that either. Yeah, it, it was, I only know like Hans Zimmer and- Yeah, uh, yeah and John, John Williams. Williams. Oh, yeah, yeah. John Williams, yeah. John Reznor. Yeah. John Reznor, right. Yeah, yeah. But that's what I was studying. So that's what I'm doing. I'm studying up on all that kind of stuff because I want to take the belt back. I want to win. I want to get all this kind of shit. You know, I want to put it together. So it's like- it's really important for me. You and are so, studying for that? How oh, you, yeah. How do you study for like the Schmodown? Oh, it's I so take, random. Okay, I take, I do a bunch of online movies. There's this, there's uh. this, um, there's this website that has 250,000 movie trivia quizzes. Wow. And so I will spend hours on it just taking over and over again mm-hmm. cl- quizzes or cl- into just my mind of what I know, what I don't know. Mm-hmm. And some of them are really irritating the way they're set up and some of them are really, <laughs> really informative. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also now for the inner geekdom, um, I'm creating flashcards for all the geek movies. Oh, I don't know any of those. Yeah. The Lord of the Rings yeah, stuff. I don't like, know. I'm yeah. watching them yeah, yeah. step by step. And when someone mentions a character, someone mentions a place, someone mentions something mm-hmm. that happens, you it seems of note, I write it down. Wow. And so now I'm going to start memorizing them more and more because I'm not one of these people that watches Lord of the Rings over and over and over again. Like other I, people are. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand watching Star Wars more than like two, twice, <laughs> maybe maybe three times on a Saturday afternoon. Do you have a favorite movie? <laughs> one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Really? Yeah, yeah. God damn it! I've only ever seen that once, and only oh, ever want to see that once. No, you got to see it again. Oh, it's heartbreaking, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's the point. That's why I just I can't watch. It's no. so painful. Well, what's the most painful part in that movie? Uh, both parts. Which which part? Brad Dorif. Brad Dorif. What happens to Brad Dorif? Is Billy Bibbit? Yeah, that's oh, the yeah. actor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brad Dorf is the actor. Oh, I didn't, I didn't you know, know his, that? I didn't know his real name. You what? I knew he was nominated you know for Brad Best Dorf Support. Is? I didn't know his name. Uh, you know who's the voice of Chucky in Child's Play? That's Brad Dorf. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the same actor. Uh, oh my no. God, Beardo, what the fuck? No, are you sure about <laughs> yes, that? Yes, I know it's true. Okay, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll fact check that. Please do. Okay, please yeah. check. Please fact check <laughs> the former Schmodown champion. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's Brad been in a number of movies. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. I thought. Did you ever see Deadwood? No. Okay. Is that the HBO show? Yeah. Oh no. He's no. the he's the doctor in Deadwood. Mm. So he's a great that, actor. That, yeah. The, what happened to him? And then what else? What? When, oh, and then when uh, the, the very ending. End. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The very ending yeah, yeah. when you realize he's not coming back. Yeah, yeah. Like he can't come back from that from yeah, what yeah. they did to him. Yeah, yeah. That's painful, man. That's that's why it's a great movie. Yeah, you I know. Like oh re- no, it's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and I like Milos Forman, but I prefer Amadeus of his stuff. I haven't seen that one. Oh my god. I'm going insane. I, I have a I have a Schmodown question for you. Oh shit! I, I just saw some like it hot. Yes. Have you seen that? Yes. What's the blood type of the main characters? Oh Jesus! Uh, a B? No. Nah. I said O. O. Yeah. Uh, they mention it all the time. They're oh, like, oh, they we're, really? type, we're the same blood type, type O. Oh, you might you might have just won me a Schmodown <laughs> in the future. Yeah, yeah. You might have just won me a Schmodown. That was a great movie. I just watched it like two days ago. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. That ending is great. The, yeah, nobody's perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's, just a great line. Yeah, that's this classic line. Like Jack <laughs> Lemmon's hilarious. He was like Jim Carrey back then. Yes, he was. was. Uh, I loved it. Very funny. Back then. Who directed it? Wait. <sighs> Who directed Wilder? It? Billy Wilder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's what year did it come out? Oh Jesus! <laughs> I want to say 1956 or 1961. 1959. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah. I was in the ballpark. See? Yeah, black the, and white. And what what was the uh one more <laughs> Jesus. from that movie? I just sure. like now because of the Schmoder, I pick up on like little things because they 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 pick up like the minutiae of things yeah, yeah, in yeah. a movie like Bespin. Yes. <laughs> oh Jesus. Yeah. Um what oil company did he say he worked for? Oh geez, I don't even know. I don't uh, remember. What Shell, was Shell Shell. Oil. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Just right. to in, uh impress like Maryland. Tony Curtis? Yeah. Yeah. To impress Marilyn Monroe. He's like, oh Shell Oil Company. He brings out a shell from the beach. Yeah. <laughs> the little things you pick up after Schmodown. That movie's so good. We're it's, probably going to cover it on the cinephiles at some point. 
Oh yeah, you also have the cinephiles too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you, what is that? Are you cover like classic movies and you rewatch them? And, yeah, uh, yeah. We cover classic movies, and Steve and I like break down the movie when we go like step by step through the movie mm-hmm. and talk about like the production history, talk about its legacy, talk about like what was going on at the time, like stories from the set because mm-hmm. we'll watch the do- we'll watch the behind the scenes stuff and like talk about some of that and how it affected the film, how the film was uh, shot or made, or uh-huh. what happened to the actors while they were doing it. Those kinds of things. So then, then we talk about, it, and then we analyze the film as we're uh-huh. talking about it too. You know? so but is this films like you've never seen before? No, no, no. Films, films that, these are classics. You're revisiting them. Yes, we're oh, okay. revisiting them okay. and talking about them. But yeah. you've also never seen a lot of classics. What me? Yeah. yeah. Where'd you get that bullshit from? Because I saw that Miss Movies tweeted something, and you said you've never seen oh, Sound of Music. No, no, you've never seen Rear Window. Oh, Rear Window. Yeah, and not a lot. I only tweeted three that I didn't see, which is Sound of Music, Rear Window, and. What was the other one? There was something else I, I, I had ju- seen. I just can't believe you haven't seen Rear Window. Though. I know, I know. It's, it's a like whole, classic Hitchcock. That's yeah. my favorite Hitchcock movie. I, I'm going to fill that hole this week. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great one. I, I know. It's a really, really good one. Yeah, I yeah. love Hitchcock. Yeah, yeah. You know, my ex-girlfriend I lived with for a few years, she's a massive Hitchcock fan. So uh-huh. we, we went to go see them in the theaters here when uh-huh. they were showing them in LA. Uh-huh. We saw Dial M for Murder in 3D. Oh, yeah, we saw, 3D? Yeah, they, yeah, it was originally shot in 3D. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you got to see it that way. Oh, it's, shit. it's an awesome way to see the film. It totally works too. It's not It's not for gags either. It's not gimmicky 3D? No, not at all. It's legitimate 3D. And, um, uh, you know, Psycho and uh, num- all this stuff. Uh, and I own 39 Steps, which is one of my favorite. Uh, that's Hitchcock. I don't know that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, get on that shit. <laughs> I'll get on that. I want to see Rope. That's my next movie. Oh, yeah. I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know, like, they shot like 10 takes or whatever, yep. or it's all shot in 10 takes. Yep. Um, this movie loves that film. Yeah. Rope. I, I got to see that. But if you talk about the cinephiles, there's a lot of behind the scenes about Marilyn Monroe on uh, Some Like It Hot. Right. We'll probably do that. Yeah. yeah. We'll probably talk about her and stuff. We like to do a biography on one of the people involved in the production of the film. So uh, it's usually the director or one of the main actors. Oh, yeah. So we'll talk about them, how they got it, and then we'll talk about how the film got made and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it's really fun. It's a great show. I love doing it. Have you talked about Apocalypse Now? Yes. That's yeah. two and a half hours. The, the podcast? The is? podcast wow. is. So yeah. did you watch Hearts of Darkness? Yeah, I love oh, Hearts of Darkness. Oh, yeah, yeah. What great. an awesome documentary. Yeah, yeah. Did you see the parody documentary on that? No. On Tropic Thunder? Wait, what do you mean? Oh. Like, there's, there's like a behind the scenes? Tro- or like a, What's that? You've got to get the Tropic Thunder DVD, uh-huh. or Blu-ray rather, uh-huh. and they have a 30-minute parody documentary of Hearts of Darkness. Uh-huh. Following how Robert Downey Jr., the character became Osiris. <laughs> and it's so brilliant. And uh, Justin Thoreau, he plays this like um, German uh, filmmaker yeah, yeah. who's doing the documentary about the making of Tropic Thunder uh-huh. uh, or, tr- or the making of the film that they're doing with uh, what's his face and Ben Stiller, Steve Coogan and Ben Stiller. Yeah. And he follows them around. And he, f- like, one of the great sequences is that um, Robert Downey Jr. as Osiris kidnaps Osiris's original family <laughs> and brings them to his house uh-huh. and has them like go through scenes and pretends to be their dad and as her husband. <laughs> it's madness, dude. Just like hearts. And there's a whole moments with it, like with Coogan where he's thinking like the, but he's going to die of a heart attack. Like, it's like all this. Oh, so there's like Francis. Ford yeah, yeah, Francis yeah, yeah. So it's all, <laughs> it's, and it's 30 minutes and it's, Fucking brilliant. Oh, I gotta but see that. Brilliant. Yeah. You'll lose your mind laughing your ass off at it. I'm telling you. I gotta see that. I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah that's good stuff. What's your favorite movie? Did you say your favorite Citizen movie? Citizen King. Citizen, really? Yeah. Is that your really favorite is? or is that like- Really is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or is that like the quintessential, no. like everyone says Citizen nope. Kane's their favorite movie? Citizen Kane was my favorite before I even knew it could be your favorite movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like I discovered it when I was 16 years old in high school. Oh, okay. Because whenever I was homesick from high school, I would rent movies. Yeah. I would go to the video world and rent movies. Like I had my mom rent movies yeah. in the morning, drop them off while she was going away to work. Yeah. So I would sit all day watching movies. Citizen Kane changed my life. Citizen Kane is when I first understood that I could like talk about movies. Like it blew my fucking mind. I saw it three times really? in one day because I was like, this is, I just would rewind it and uh-huh. start it again. But what, what about it like blew your mind? I think everything about the nonlinear storytelling, everything about the idea that it's not a straight up film, like where he's like, okay, this, you know, boy falls in love, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, and there's a villain, there's an, a, a, a protagonist and the protagonist goes, no, this was all told out of sequence and mm-hmm. it's all recollection. Mm-hmm. None of it is a through line. Mm-hmm. It's all recollection. And so it, it showed to me like you could tell a movie where you don't know who's telling the truth and that everybody has a different perspective on this person's life because this person never gets to get interviewed about his own life. Uh, and so people, the whole film is people from the opening news reel to the guys at the end before they throw the thing into the fire that I don't want to ruin for anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. it's a 50 year old, 60 year old film, <laughs> yeah. but like who hasn't seen it? A 70 year old film really. Yeah. But like, uh, is all them talking about him, but he never gets to tell you his story. Uh His story is seen through everyone else's eyes. 
So what's the truth? Though and, that's the whole point that there is no truth. That there is it? no truth. That yeah, yeah. no matter how we live our lives, no matter what we think, we're never going to be the author of our own world because everyone else has an opinion and mm-hmm. they see it through their own prism, through their own experiences, through their own shit. Mm-hmm. They see your actions, decipher your actions as they see it and not as you may have intended it. Mm-hmm. And so your life in the end, no matter what you do, is going to be told by other people through their perceptions yeah. and not your own. It's based on other people or based on other yeah, people's perceptions. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's also the amazing study of a man falling, a great man falling apart mm-hmm. because of a fateful decision by his mom when he's 10 years old. To give him away? To give him away. Yeah. And if his mom hadn't given him away, he might have been all right. He might not have made all that money. He might not have been like a higher end education. Yeah. yeah. But he'd have been all right. Yeah. And the thing is, this is great. There's a great line in the movie, Great Exchange, when he says, where uh, his benefactor says to him, don't you think you did? Don't you think you were a great man? And he says to him in this moment of clarity, he says, I did all right under the circumstances. Uh-huh. And that's what he says. So he, he even knows yeah, yeah. that he is not real. Like his, who he is, is not real. And he, that's even retold by him, by Thatcher. Oh, that, that's not his That's not his recounting that's of the Thatcher's story. That's Thatcher's recollection of the oh, story. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's uh-huh. the thing. Everything is told, and Bernstein's recollection of the story. So everything is told through everyone else's minds. Mm. And nothing is, so you have to experience this man's life through everyone else's, per, and I just thought, to my mind, I was like, fuck, I never conceived that you could tell a story like that. It just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. And so it has always been one that I go back to and, and watch. And in fact, when my girlfriend and I were breaking, it was really funny. My, my, my uh, girlfriend from, when I saw for, uh, dated for five years, we went to see Citizen Kane right as we were breaking up mm-hmm. and I, she'd never seen it. Mm-hmm. And I take her to see it. And when she came out of the room, she goes, I understand you better than I've ever understood you before. <laughs> what? She said, because, because of that, the movie, because of the movie, uh-huh. the movie, she loved the movie, Yeah, but it showed to her like, uh, how I see things and why I always factor in other people's points of views, other people's perspectives and how I don't ever see a solid truth about anything because mm-hmm. everything is seen through our prism of understanding. There is mm-hmm. no truth. There is only a perception of truth. Uh-huh. And so how can we really know anything? But how then, can we know anybody? <laughs> but then are you worried about like what other people are thinking about you or what other people, how they're like uh, uh, perceiving you? Only in the sense that can you get me, can, can, can I be good enough for you in your mind that you can give me the job? Uh, That's the only thing I care about. Uh-huh. I am on my own journey to, and I, we've talked about it on the podcast about my own versions of therapy, my own, like I'm on my own journey to, discover who to to realize who i am Mm -hmm. and i want to keep learning till i'm dead Mm -hmm. you know and that to me is wisdom it's not like okay i figured myself out let's move on it's (laughs) i'm just gonna yeah yeah, we're good i'm just me now for the rest of my life yeah i want something where it's like where i just want to keep learning and growing and progressing and and right now i'm in this weird place where i'm transitioning and it's Mm -hmm. not easy and there's some tough days you know and but I know this is part of the process where I had, I had seven years of like really unadulterated bliss mm. of where I was like very happy with my friends, very happy with my life. Like I was okay. But now I feel this pressure that time is running out. Uh-huh. And so I'm trying to find new ways to deal with my world so I can function in it and, and be happy in it. Be- because of your age, you think? Yes, you know, because of my age and because of these recent experiences with these with the the women I was dating, like it just it was like, oh well, I I don't have anyone. Uh-huh. I don't have anyone to be there for me when I come home at night. I don't have anyone to kind of share my successes with or my losses with. Like, uh, but I, does, does that I'm upset? Kind of, or sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kind of the solo person uh-huh. sitting here going like, well, where's why? Yeah. You know, where's my situation? And so. I'm but just in a transition place. Does that upset you, like seeing people like that? No, not, it doesn't upset me at all. Uh-huh. It just makes me feel uh, at times lonely. Like, uh-huh. oh shit, I don't have anyone. Uh-huh. And so I'm figuring out, because, and I don't have anyone right now because I'm in this transition place. Like I'm in discovering who I am now all over again. Mm. And it's like, all I can describe is like a, the, the cocoon in the butterfly. Like mm. I had this sequence where I was, I have always been the butterfly and then I be, go into this cocoon and then I become the butterfly again and goes cocoon and come the butterfly mm. again. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now is in this cocoon place where I'm with my thoughts, pro, uh, processing what has happened over the last few years and then figuring out what to do next. And I, and I like it. Mm-hmm. It's not easy, but it's, it's, I know that there's a reason for it, you know? But do you always like look back at your past relationships and say, "Hey, like what went wrong, yes, and like what, how do I fix that?" Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the the majority of the issues have always been my 
uh, my, well, not always, but like, I think the people I choose, mm -hmm. I'm an empath mm -hmm. and I tend to choose narcissists, mm -hmm. which is not a negative. Like, I'm not saying they're bad people. Mm -hmm. I think some people are just focused on achieving their needs and their goals and their wants. And I, because I'm an empath, am willing to take a seat, a back seat to their needs. Uh -huh. And then I realize, wait, what about my needs? But by the time I talk about my needs, it's too far down the road and it becomes conflict. Uh -huh. And so, and then my own insecurities, my own self-esteem stuff that had been there for years, that I didn't know was dormant inside me comes out in those moments and it ends up ruining the relationship. And then I want to leave. Like uh -huh. I'm always going like, well, maybe I should leave. Maybe oh, I should it's end you this. that ends it. Yeah, well, I don't end it. Uh -huh. I propose ending it, uh -huh. which is what I do as a safety mechanism. Like a, a, a what do they call that? Like a defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah defense mechanism. I go, well, maybe we should end it then. Yeah. Because yeah. like, I think somehow I'm retaining power by being the first person to end it. Mm. And what it comes back to in the end, Beardo, is vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. And this is what I'm learning with, with, uh, with, um, my spiritual advisor at where I'm going to Mosaic and the people I talk to um, at the Buddha Center is like, you've been so afraid to put your heart on the line because you're afraid that if they leave you, you somehow lost. You think of everything as win and lose. Yeah. And this is where my competitive nature can be a detriment in my relationships because it's my, it's in my mind, it's about winning. Not, yeah. not winning the argument, not winning the war. It's about winning the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I leave first, or if I propose them, somehow I retain power. Like I'm deciding that yeah. it's over. Right? You're like I didn't want to. I didn't want to win anyway. Yes. Yeah. Which which is an, and now I've realized how much of an empty gesture that is because mm -hmm. there was someone I did last year who I really cared about and I lost her because I suggested ending it rather than just kind of writing out a bad night. I mm -hmm. was like, well, maybe this is just the end of us. And she said, "What? You really want to? Maybe you're right." Oh, oh, you and, put that in her mind and mm -hmm. she, she went with it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And everything else she didn't hear, yeah. she heard that. And, but you know, you do, you do your own, you do your therapy and you figure, oh, well, there's stuff going on for her too. Mm -hmm. And that I was never going to be the right person for her anyway, in the long run. So you do, you realize that as well. So it's a, but it doesn't take away the fact of the work that I have to do, which is, which I love now. Like I'm so happy with the work I've done over the last few months to kind of strip out the cobwebs and, you know, and it was really bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I almost killed myself in November and I've talked about that in film therapy with, with Brianne, like right before the schmodown, the, the, whatever it was we did in November, it was the one in like November. Either like a spectacular free for all yeah, or one yeah, of those. The schmodown, right before uh, the schmodown spectacular, uh -huh. two or three days beforehand, I had, I had a massive breakdown. And I really was going to do it. From Be from what though? Like, what I, was, what I got, caused it? I had gotten a fight with that girl and uh. she was, in my mind, she was this sweet little angel and I had pushed her too far for my own insecurities, my own mm -hmm. need to have her tell me what she feels about me, you know, what to like reiterate. Because she was blowing hot and cold mm -hmm. and this is what I couldn't tell at the time. In my mind, I thought she was just rejecting me, rejecting me, rejecting me. And then she would be, she would be accepting me, then she'd be rejecting me. And so to me, I couldn't handle the roller coaster. Right. Wait. So she was rejecting you, or, or what? In your I mind, I thought she was rejecting. In your mind, yeah. She just, in my mind, she but, was. But in her mind, like everything's, everything's in my, her mind, everything was great uh -huh. because she was in control. Once mm. again, she was in control because I, she, I wanted the relationship more than she did, uh -huh. and so she was in control in the situation. And so, but in my mind, I built her up to be this angelic, sweet little person. Mm. Uh, but in fact, she's a person that needs a lot of attention and needs a lot of whatever, which I discovered later, but I didn't know it at the time. And then like, once you realize that, you say, I don't want to be in this relationship. Right. Well, that no, I, I had hurt her. And then by hurting her, I felt terrible about myself. Uh, and I said, if I can hurt someone this sweet and angelic, I have no value as a partner. If I still can't make it work with someone like this, uh -huh. there's something wrong with me. If I can't be with somebody there's no point that I keep going on the earth because I don't care about being a CEO and making millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I care about finding someone to share my life with. And so if I am a terrible, this terrible a partner at this late of an age, there's no way out for me. I'm, I'm going to do this. Like you're a lost cause. Yeah, like I'm you a lost cause. You can't be fixed. Absolutely. That, that's what you think. That's though. what I thought. Uh -huh. Right. And um, Miss Movies, uh, that morning, Miss Movies tweeted a, a, retweeted a suicide prevention hotline. Uh-huh. And I turned just by reflex. I and I was in the, I was in the, like, I can't even, I don't have words for the level of depression that I was in. Like it was cataclysmic. It was so all consuming. What was the breakdown? Like, were you, at, were you here? Or yeah, were, I was here. I'd woke up in the morning and I just felt like my heart had just been ripped out of my chest. And I huh. felt like I had no reason to keep going. Uh -huh. None. So then what did you decide to do? Well, that's the thing. I just, by instinct, I, cause I do that now, as soon as I wake up, I, open my phone and go on Twitter and like see who commented and like or comment back. 
And I just happened to open it, and then my friend, or Brienne had retweeted uh, a suicide prevention hotline mm -hmm. number, and I called the suicide prevention, and I never thought I would. But I was at that point where I was like, once again, this desperate desire to live, uh -huh. even though there are pieces of me saying, end it. So you think, because you said it's in, like it's a, it's a physical thing in your mind that people have that solution yes. to end themselves. Yes. That you all, you're always going to have that, but in, but you can fight that back. Yes. Now, now because of the, what would, I, because of this experience, mm -hmm. I was able to confront like 30 years of that impulse, 30 years of that feeling mm -hmm. that I, to me had become like just standard feelings to have. Mm -hmm. When you realize when you do the therapy, it's, it's not. And so it's not a standard thing that people want to kill themselves no. as options. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so for me, it was so realistic to me because it felt so, it had been my partner for so long. Uh -huh. And I kind of liken it to Legion. If you've seen Legion, the show, that demon that is with him since birth, that is mm. what that is. Yeah, yeah. It becomes such a part of you that you ignore it when it's convenient. And when it comes for you, you can give into it. Mm -hmm. And so when it came for me, it was really, and so me calling that hotline was one of the, was my way of fighting. And they were amazing. And they talked to me for 45 minutes. They talked me and they said to me, like, I think the problem is that this is not the right girl for you. Like yeah. you have a right to express your feelings. You have a right to express what you want, how you want the relationship to work. Mm -hmm. And if she's not going to give that to you, then you need to get out of that relationship. And I think yeah. your instinct to get out of that relationship and to suggest getting out of it is the right instinct because that girl isn't the right girl for you. Yeah. Like and you, you were know right. it. You were, you were yeah, right. Yeah, in the yeah. end, I was right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that oh, that hit whatever hit. And so for the next two to three, while I was doing the therapy, even while I was doing the therapy, brother, every morning I woke up at 5 a.m. was a negotiation to not kill myself. Really? Every morning for months. Every day you have to every deal with that. Every day. How, how close like are you to like, were you to doing it? Very, very close. There were mornings where I was very, very close. I remember one morning I had to meditate for three hours to mm -hmm. stop myself from doing it. Three hours. I would be, I would cry. Uh -huh. I endlessly, I would cry. I would feel like, how am I ever going to climb out of this? Yeah. I've never felt it to this level. And I think what had happened was it just, it just opened what had been, like I said, what had been sitting there for so long mm -hmm. and it all came out and it was so overwhelming that I didn't know how to handle it. Uh -huh. And um, thank God my friend stepped up with the two therapists because yeah. she's like, I don't want you to leave this earth. I want to do whatever I can on my dime because she runs a mental health facility. She stood up, she, she, uh, uh, um, stood up for me and, and made a stand for me rather and mm -hmm. said like, I don't want this to, please, will you accept my help? And mm -hmm. I was like, I would, yes, I would like that. And so, you know, that whole day of going through it was really, really difficult. And I had to go to an ER to get a psych eval. It was a whole thing, man. And it was not easy, but it, that's how deep it went. And two of my friends stayed with me the whole day mm -hmm. um, and were great. And then my friends, and my other friends took care of me at night. Like my friends really stepped up, man. Yeah. And they showed me how much they loved me. And, and I wasn't doing it to get love or doing it for any other reason than not I was attention in this place. No, not oh, at yeah. all. It was just like, this is how I'm feeling. This is where I'm at. Like I'm... I have to do something. And so mm -hmm. while I could see the therapist, there were I, for the other six days I had to function. Mm -hmm. And so my friend, uh, Mark, he suggested this, uh, uh, podcast called the meditation podcast. And so this couple does met guided meditations and those meditations saved my, like really saved my life. Really? It's Cause when it was bad, I would put those on. And the thing is, I had to see this girl at work all the time, and I still do. Uh -huh. And at the time, like seeing her at work was just like slamming the dagger into my heart over yeah. and over and over again because I had felt like she was one that got away or she was this. And this was before I had gone through my therapy and talked about everything mm -hmm. and realized what had happened. So for the first couple of months, seeing her at work was like hell on earth, man. It was like physically painful. Physically painful. Yeah. yeah. And and I was and I told her I, I like I I tried to kind of figure things out up until Christmas Eve. And I realized that uh, she was just keeping me as an option. I was never, ever seriously in contention with this woman. Uh -huh. And although I thought it wasn't the right thing, I would go back and forth about it uh -huh. because I really wanted to believe that we could make it work somehow. And in the end, we couldn't because we're not right for each other. Yeah. You know, I need but you some... understand that now. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah, I'm out of it now. Yeah. And that's why I talk about it. I can talk about it logically and knowledgeably uh -huh. because there's no there's no possibility of me doing it. So you realize, hey, that was a mistake. Yes. Or like that was just kind of dumb what I did. Yes. Or thinking, well, not, not dumb. dumb, but just like that was wrong in thinking that. 
what? Like thinking that she was the one that got yes, away. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That was in the end what I had come to because because doing the therapy, you realize, and then retell it. Once you retell the story and all the ways that she kind of hurt me and all the ways that she kind of like didn't step up and all the ways that she kind of like disregarded me, mm -hmm. in the end, I was right yeah. because she was blowing hot and cold because she wasn't sure she wanted to be in the situation with me. And she didn't have the guts to step up and say, you know what? This is wrong. She made it seem as if she wasn't the right person for me. She would be like, you know, you're right. You're, uh, maybe I'm not the right person for you. So she made it seem as if like, you know, she was doing something benevolent yeah, yeah, when yeah. in fact she had been selfish. Yeah, and yeah. so, and didn't want to own up to being selfish because she doesn't like to see herself in a bad light. Mm. And she does things to make herself feel like, like she's some kind of perfect thing. And yeah. so that's her business. That's her life. That's her business. But I had put on her expectations of a person that she wasn't. Mm. And that was what I was paying for, is the expectations I had created in my mind. And when I would tell the expectations to both of my counselors, they'd be like, but nothing you have said in relating your story <laughs> yeah. fits that she had any of that in her. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, that's amazing. So the therapy was, both the therapists were really powerful. And then doing the reading that I, that Danny Fernandez gave me some books that were really powerful to me. Cause Danny deals with this. Danny deals with her, uh -huh. the, she has this you know, within her too, this uh -huh. mental health stuff. And so, and it's a really powerful thing. And I want to become a spokesman for people like, I want to become a spokesman for, for mental health stuff because a lot of people suffer through this. Mm -hmm. A lot, and a lot of people have reached out to me since the film therapy podcast with Brienne to tell me their stories. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have reached out to me on DMs after I mentioned it in the Outlaw Nation podcast a couple times like they they mentioned it they they some so there's a power in that uh -huh. and and to me because i climbed out of it um and i feel good like i feel i don't even i don't feel the need to meditate in all the time anymore i like i can see her work it's not a big deal mm -hmm. and i can live my life you know and it's great and the schmodown has helped being the outlaw the character has been a nice release for me yeah you know and doing these doing podcasts like this like it's just great to talk about it because i'm out of it yeah you know and i don't have the impulse to do it anymore i don't have the desire to do it anymore i think she was a blessing in disguise mm -hmm. that she exposed this stuff that had been within me for a long time and that I needed to confront in order to become a better partner, a better life partner for the woman that I'm going to marry or the person I'm going to be with, yeah. you know? And so it's almost a, it's almost a God's like people say things happen for a reason. I think she happened for a reason at the right time because mm -hmm. I was finally ready to listen to it. Yeah. You know, cause I think some of these patterns corroded the five year relationship I had as well. And so having to finally have it come to me and go like, Hey, you got to take a look at this. It was really powerful for me. Yeah. Like if it happened like a few, few years earlier, it wouldn't have been. No, I wouldn't yeah. have heard the message. Yeah. This was the right time. I finally heard the message. And I made the changes, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm progressing towards a point where I'm ready to be in a relationship again. I'm not now. Mm -hmm. I'm just dating around and, you know, kind of, you know, enjoying. And I like to, you know, like do that and date and meet and hang out and do mm -hmm. whatever. And But like I'm working towards that place where I'm ready to start a new relationship again. You know? So you're in, are you in a good place now? Yeah, I'm like, in a great place you, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. You're enjoying life. You're yes. Back, you're back on top. Now. I'm back on top. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much enjoying my life. And um, you know, doing the podcast. I wouldn't have started Outlaw Nation if I wasn't ready to start it. And oh, it's, yeah. it's something Christian suggested to me like two months ago. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't ready two months ago. Uh -huh. I wasn't ready. I had to work towards it. And you, when I was ready, I made it. Are you still in therapy? No. No. I stopped doing the therapy uh, about a month ago. Do you feel like you only go to it when you need it? Or should you like go to it like uh, consistently? Well, I think I'm a different kind of person. I think other people like to go consistently because they need it consistently. Uh -huh. I'm, I need it in periods of my life. Uh -huh. uh, I can't figure this out on my own. I feel desperate or despondent. Mm -hmm. I need a professional's opinion and guidance mm -hmm. because my mind, I'm, I'm an intelligent guy and I'm emotionally intelligent and regular intelligent as well. And so like, to me, it's like, I, I need to hear another way of looking at this. I need yeah. to hear another way of like processing this. Cause you think you're right in your mind. You yes. Think, you think course. you understand it. Like it's the only way that it could be. Yeah. But someone has to, you need an outside perspective to say, Hey, that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so it's been like, it's so, so for me, it's been a really powerful thing to kind of like uh, embrace and then explore. And then, so I'm on top in a different way mm -hmm. because what had been before was a Trojan horse of emotion. That's what I say. I would go into these relationships with a Trojan horse, mm -hmm. which is I would convey this kind of strength and power, mm -hmm. but underneath there was nothing inside but insecurity and sadness uh, and fear yeah and so once that got exposed people felt like they had bought certain goods and, uh, they, and they, <laughs> certain goods were not what, yeah, what yeah. they got you know and so um and so that's what would happen so what i've done over the last few months is really work on 
building the foundation of what's myself inside myself so that when I go into a relationship, I'm not looking for them to save me or to complete me or to make me whole. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to be a partnership. Yeah. And that's important. And which is which is believing their words, trusting their words, and then and then trusting my value. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people in relationships now, even in relationships now, who have trouble believing their value. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not just because I'm single; it's because it's true. Like this is happens even people who are married. Mm -hmm. You know, they the person they get in married with the wrong person, they take time, and and, and through time they erode their value. So mm -hmm. um, to me, it's like it's it's been a it's been a fantastic experience. It's been real close to the at last experience, but <laughs> but. To climb out of it, there's power in that for me. Yeah. And there's power in that. And I hope anyone listening to it, to me, to us, I say, fight, mm -hmm. climb out of it. You know, I still take my dad's lesson, fight, no matter what, fight. Yeah. And um, I tell you that if you're listening and you're down or you're whatever, you're like, fight, take it step by step, read the books, do meditation. It's not over. It's not over. There's a way out. If you have friends, lean on your friends, tell them what you're going through, open your world up, you know? I told my friends and they were amazing to step up. A couple of them kind of pulled away because they were weirded out by it, but everyone else really stepped up and was there. And I'm telling you, it's possible, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, like what your dad said, stick with it. Yeah, yeah, stick with it, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, you, it's late now. Yeah, now I think yeah, it's yeah, time yeah, to yeah, go. Yeah, I thank, agree. thank you so much for doing this. We, Thank did, you, we did beat the record, by the way. What? We did? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you have to be the one to beat the record. <laughs> yeah, screw you, Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for doing this. And uh, what's your what's your Twitter and your oh, Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Beardo. Uh, yeah, you guys can find me at the Roca says R O C H A on Twitter and on Instagram. And then uh, you, uh, of course, the Cinephiles cine dash files on uh itunes stitcher and youtube the outlaw nation podcast on the schmozno podcast channel and on youtube on the schmozno channel on youtube uh and then fridays on collider movie talk at 10 a.m and uh, thanks guys for everything uh i talked about thank you yeah. beardo for having me on man thank you so much for doing this yeah. i hope you had a good time i had a great time <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i'm at schmoz beardo and you can find also you're on the schmodown oh the schmodown yeah. yes but um thank it's you the outlaw that's it let's get out of here <laughs>